Chapter 29 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. Chapter 29 The Life of John Claxton, alias Johnston a thief, etc. This unhappy malefactor was amongst the number of those who, through want of education, was the more easily drawn into the prosecution of such practices as became fatal to him. His father was a common sailor belonging to the town of Sunderland, who had it not in his power to breed him in a very extraordinary manner, and what little he was able to do was frustrated by the evil inclinations of his son, who, instead of applying himself closely while he remained at school, loitered away his time, and made little or no proficiency there. His head, as those of most seamen's children do, ran continually on voyages and seeing foreign countries, with which roving temper the father too readily complied, and while yet a boy, unacquainted with any kind of learning and unsettled in the principles of religion he was sent forth into the world to pick up either as he could the first voyage he made was up the straits where he touched at gibraltar and went soon after to leghorn the port to which they were bound being a young sprightly lad the mate carried him on shore with him and being a man of intrigue made use of him to go between him and an Irish woman who was married to an Italian captain of a ship. The lady's husband was in Sicily, and they therefore apprehended themselves to be secure. She proposed to the mate the carrying off of jewels and other things to the amount of some thousand crowns, and then flying with him from Italy. The project had certainly succeeded, if it had not been for their imprudence, for the mate who passed for her cousin, being continually in the house for three days before the ship went away, a suspicion entered into some of the neighbors, as they often do amongst Italians, that there was something more than ordinary concealed under the frequency of his visits. They therefore dispatched a messenger to Signor Stefano de Calvo, the captain's brother, with the account of their surmises. He came immediately to Leghorn, and going directly to his brother's house, found his sister had packed up all his valuable effects, and, having loaded the boy with as much as he could carry, was on the point of setting out with him for the vessel. Stefano dragged her back into an inner apartment, where he locked her in, and afterwards fastened the doors of the outward apartment through which they passed thither. But Jack, seeing how things went, laid down his burden, and fled as hard as he could drive to the port, where he gave notice to the master of their disappointment, and caused the vessel immediately to weigh anchor, and stand to sea, as fearing the consequences of the affair, which he knew would make a great noise, and might possibly turn to the detriment of his owners. Claxton had hitherto done nothing that was criminal within the eye of the law, though while at sea, he was continually employed in some mischievous trick or other. When he came into England, the ship happened to go to Yarmouth, and as all places were alike to him, so short a stay there engaged him to marry a young woman, who had some little matter of money, with which he proposed to do for himself some little matter at sea, and, taking the greatest part of it with him, came up to London in order to see after a good voyage. But this was the most fatal journey he ever made, for, falling unfortunately into the hands of bad women and their companions, they quickly drew him to be as bad as themselves, so that forgetting the poor woman he had married, and regardless of the business which brought him up to town, he gave himself up entirely to the pursuit of such villainies as they taught him, and in a short space became as expert a proficient as any in the gang. Some of them had consulted together to rob a woodmonger's house of a considerable quantity of plate, 
but there was one difficulty to be encountered without overcoming which there was no hopes of success the woodmonger's maid carried up the keys every night to her master the outer court having a gate to it and unless they could call upon some stratagem either to prevent the gate being shut or to gain the means of unlocking it their attempt was certainly in vain in order to bring this to pass they put jack who was a neat little fellow into a very good habit and found means to introduce him to the acquaintance of the wench at a neighbouring chandler's shop where he took lodgings in a fortnight's time he prevailed upon Mrs. Anne to come out at twelve of the clock to meet him, which she could not do without leaving the great gate ajar, having first carried up the key to her master, though, for her own conveniency, she had thus left it upon a single lock. While she and her sweetheart were drinking punch and making merry together, the rest of the Confederates got into the house and carried away silver plate to the value of eighty pounds, leaving everything behind them in so good order that the maid, who was a little tipsy into the bargain, discovered nothing that night. Going to acquaint her lover with the accident as soon as it was found out, to her great surprise she was informed that he was removed, having carried away all the things before his landlord and landlady were up. The girl carefully concealed the passage, knowing how fatal it would be to her if it should reach her master's ears but for her spark she heard no more of him until his commitment to newgate for another fact for which he was ordered for transportation being on board the vessel with the rest of the convicts he soon procured the favour of the master to be let to go out upon deck and being a strong able sailor he ingratiated himself so far as to meet no worse usage than any other sailor in the ship on their arrival at the canaries where by stress of weather they were obliged to put in a quarrel happened between the master of their vessel and the captain of a jamaica man homeward bound it ended in a duel with sword and pistol and the captain of the transport having carried john with him he behaved so well upon this occasion that he promised him his liberty as soon as they arrived in america which he honourably performed and jack was so indefatigable in his endeavours to get home that he arrived at london six weeks before the captain came back he herded again with his old crew though before he was able to do much mischief amongst them he was apprehended for returning from transportation and was at the next sessions tried and convicted by this time the captain who had carried him was arrived and hearing of john's misfortune he made such interest as procured the sentence of death to be changed into a second transportation such narrow escapes one would have imagined might have taught him how dangerous a thing it was to dally with the laws of the nation in any respect whatsoever and yet when he was on shore in new england where the master took care to provide him with as easy a service as a man could have wished as soon as the captain's back was turned he found means to give the planter the slip and in nine months time revisited london a second time whether he intended to have gone on in the old trade or no is impossible for us to determine but this we are certain that he had not been in england many weeks ere a person who made it his business to detect such as returned from transportation clapped him up in his old lodging at newgate brought him to his trial and convicted him the third time as soon as he had received sentence he relinquished all hopes of life and as in all this time he had never made any enquiry after his wife at yarmouth so he would not now bring an odium upon her and her family by sending to them and making his misfortune public in the place where they lived the man seemed to be of an easy tractable disposition readily yielding to whatever those who conversed with them desired to bring him to whether it were good or evil 
he attended with great seeming piety and devotion to the books which thomas smith read to his fellow prisoners and gained thereby a tolerable notion of the duty of repentance and that faith which men ought to have in jesus christ thus by degrees he brought himself to a perfect indifference as to life or death and at the place of execution showed neither by change of colour or any other symptom any extraordinary fear of his approaching dissolution and having conformed very devoutly to the prayers said by the ordinary after a short private devotion he submitted to his fate with the aforementioned malefactors smith and reynolds being then about twenty-eight years old or thereabouts end of chapter twenty nine recording by linda johnson Chapter 30 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2 by Arthur L. Hayward. Chapter 30 The Life of Mary Stanford, a Pickpocket and Thief this unfortunate woman was born of very good parents who sent her to school and caused her to be bred up in every other respect so as to be capable of performing well in her station of the world and doing her duty towards god from a just notion of religion but it happening unluckily that she set her mind on nothing so much as the company of young men and running about with them to fears and such other country diversions her friends were put under the necessity of sending her to london a thing which they saw could not be avoided when she came to town she got in one or two good places which she soon lost from her forward behaviour and having been seduced by a footman she soon became a common street-walker and practised all the vile arts of those women who were a scandal to their sex when she was young she was tolerably handsome and associated herself with one black mary whose true name was mary rawlins a woman of notorious ill fame and who from being kept by a man of substance in the city by her own ill management was turned upon the town and reduced to getting her bread after the infamous manner of the inmates of drury these two marys used to walk together between temple bar and Ludget hill where sometimes they met with foolish young fellows out of whom they got considerable sums though at other times their adventures produced so little that they were obliged to part with almost every rag of cloths they had nay they were now and then reduced so low that one was obliged to stay at home while the other went out mary rawlins contrary to the rules established amongst the sisterhood married a man who had been a life guardsman and so was obliged to remove her lodgings to go with him into a little court near king street westminster some of my readers may perhaps imagine that either her love for her husband or the fear of his authority might work a reformation but therein they would be highly mistaken for he proposed no other end to himself than plundering her of those presents she received from gallants so that whenever evening drew on he was very assiduous for her to turn out as they phrase it that is to go upon the street walking account picking pockets she had not followed this trait long before she became so uneasy under it that one night meeting with her old companion stanford she persuaded her to remove into a new quarter of the town whither she fled to her from her husband they there carried on their intrigues together and lived much more at their ease than they had done before for being now got towards wapping they drew in the sailors when they had any money to part with for their favours and getting into acquaintance with some navy solicitors they found means to raise them cash at the rate of sixty per cent to the broker and as much to the whore thus they lived till stanford took it in her head to serve her partner as she had done her before 
for finding a man mad enough to marry her she was fool enough to consent to the marriage but after living with the man for about a year she repented her bargain and left him as rawlins had done hers some time after this she contracted an acquaintance with another man at that time servant to a person in the city by him she had a child which as it increased her necessary expense so it plunged her into the greater difficulty of knowing how to supply it however fancying her gains would be larger if she piled by herself she totally left the company of her former associates and applied herself with an infamous industry to her shameful trade of prostitution not long after she had entered upon this single method of street walking she fell into the company of a gentleman who was more than ordinary amorous of her and who after treating her with a supper lay with her and as she said gave her four guineas but he on the contrary charged her with picking his pocket of a chagrin book a silk handkerchief and the money before mentioned for this fact she was committed to newgate and soon after tried and convicted notwithstanding her excuse of the man bestowing it on her as a present after she had received sentence some of her friends gave her hopes of having it changed into a transportation pardon but this she rejected utterly declaring that she had rather die not only the most ignominious but the most cruel death that could be invented at home rather than be sent abroad to slave for her living such strange apprehensions enter into the head of these unhappy creatures and hinder them from taking the advantage of the only possibility they have left of tasting happiness on the side of the grave and as this aversion to the plantations has so bad effects especially in making the convicts desirous of escaping from the vessel or of flying out of the country whither they were sent almost before they have seen it i am surprised that no care has been taken to print a particular and authentic account of the manner in which they are treated in those places i know it may be suggested that the terror of such usage as they are represented to meet with there has often a good effect in diverting them from such acts as they know must bring them to transportation yet though i confess i have heard this more than once repeated yet i am far from being convinced and i am thoroughly satisfied that instead of magnifying the measures of their pretended slavery or rather of inventing stories that make a very easy service pass on these unhappy creatures for the severest bondage the convicts should be told the true state of the case and be put in mind that instead of suffering death the lenity of our constitution permitted them to be removed into another climate no way inferior to that in which they were born where they were to perform no harder tasks than those who work honestly for their bread in england do and this not under persons of another nation who might treat them with less humanity but with those who are no less english for their living in the new than if they dwelt in old england people famous for their humanity justice and piety footnote a new hampshire law regulating the behaviour of masters towards their white servants enacts if any man smite out the eye or tooth of his man-servant or maid-servant or otherwise mime or disfigure them much unless it be mere casualty he shall let him or her go free from his service and shall allow such further recompense as the court of quarter sessions shall adjudge them a good example of new england humanity and justice End of footnote. and amongst whom they are sure of mating with no variation of manners customs etc unless in respect of the progress of their vices which are at present more numerous there than in their motherland i say if pains were taken to instil into those these unhappy persons such notions at the same time demonstrating to them that from being exposed either to want and necessity from the laws they had sustained of this reputation and being thereby under a kind of force in the following their old courses and as soon as discharged from the fears of death supposing a free pardon could be procured 
obliged to run a like hazard immediately after. They might probably conceive justly of that clemency which is extended towards them, and instead of shunning transportation, flying from the country where they are landed as soon as they have set their foot in them, or neglecting opportunities they might have on their first coming there, and be brought to serve their masters faithfully, to endure the time of their service cheerfully, and settle afterwards in the best manner they are able, so as to pass the close of their life in an honest, easy, and reputable manner. Now it too often happens that their last end is worse than their first, because those who return from transportation being sure of death if apprehended are led thereby to behave themselves worse and more cruelly than any malefactors whatsoever but to return to mary stanford who led us into this digression she showed little or no regard for anything no not even for her own child who she said she hoped would be well taken care of by the parish and added that she had been a great sinner for which she hoped god would forgive her praying as well as she could both while under sentence and at the place of execution she declared that she bore no malice either against her prosecutor or any other person and in this disposition she finished her life at tyburn the same day with the aforementioned malefactors being at that time near thirty-six years of age End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one of lives of the most remarkable criminals volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lives of the most remarkable criminals volume two by arthur l havers chapter thirty one the life of john cartwright a thief this unhappy young man was born in yorkshire of a tolerable family who had been sufficiently careful in having him instructed in whatever was necessary for a person of his condition breeding him up to all works of husbandry in general and also qualifying him in every respect for a gentleman's service in one of which capacities they were in hopes he would not find it difficult to get his bread he lived with several persons in the country with unspotted reputation until at last a whim came into his head of coming up to london an uncle of his procured him a very good service with one mr sharvin a mercer in the paternoster road with whom he stayed for some time with great satisfaction on both sides for his master was highly pleased with the careful industry of the young man's temper and cartwright on the other side had not the least reason to complain considering the great kindness and indulgence with which he was used but some young fellows of loose principles taking notice of cartwright's easy and tractable temper quickly drew him into becoming fond of their company and conversation every other sunday he was permitted to go out where he would until nine o'clock at night and these young fellows meeting at a fine alley house not far from his master's house whither they begin to bring yorkshire john as they called him there they usually ran over the description of the diversions of the town and of those places round it which are most remarkable for the result of the company these were new scenes to poor john who was unacquainted with any representation better than a puppet show or recreation of a superior nature to bull baitings at a country fair and therefore his thoughts were extremely taken up with all he heard and his companions were so obliging that they took abundance of pains to satisfy such questions as he asked them and were often soliciting him to go and partake with them at plays dancing bouts and all the various divertisements to which young unthinking youths are addicted he wanted not many entreaties to comply with their request but money the main ingredient in such delights was wanting and of this he at last acknowledged the deficiency to one of the young men his companions this fellow took no notice of it at that time 
further than to wish he had more and to tell him that a young man of his spirit ought never to be without and that there were ways and means enough to get it if a man had not as much cash as courage he repeated these insinuations often without explaining them at all until frequent stories of the fine sights at the theatres and elsewhere had so far raised poor john's curiosity that one evening he entreated his companion to let him into the bottom of what he meant the cunning villain turned it at first into a jest and continued to banter him about his being a country put and so forth until he perceived it was past twelve o'clock and knew that it was too late for him to get in at home then he told him that if he promised never to reveal it he would tell him what he meant john being full of liquor swore he would not and the other replied why here you stand complaining of the want of money while i warrant you there's a hundred or two pounds in your master's drawer under the counter maybe there may said cartwright but what's that to me nay replied the other nothing if you have not the courage to go and fetch it why now you can get in i'm sure come i'll put you in a way of never being taken cartwright who was half drunk remembered that there was a parcel of gold in the drawer and that it was in his power to get at a silver watch and some plate so that he fatally yielded to the temptations of his companion and thereupon the next morning conveyed to him the watch four score pounds in money and three silver spoons they shared the greatest part of the booty of which cartwright was quickly cheated and though he fled with the remainder as far as monmouthshire in wells yet some way or other he was there detected committed prisoner to the country gaol and then sent up to london where a few days after his arrival he was tried and convicted never poor wretch suffered deeper affliction than he did in the reflection of his follies for giving up all hopes of life he spent the whole interval of time between sentence and execution in grieving for the sorrows he had brought upon himself and the stain his ignominious death would leave upon his family his companion in the meantime was fled far enough out of the reach of justice so that cartwright had nothing to expect but death to which he patiently submitted acknowledging upon all occasions the justice of that sentence which had befallen him and wishing that his death might be sufficient to warn other young men in such circumstances as his once were from falling into faults of that kind which had brought him to ruin and shame yet though he laid aside all desires relating to worldly things he yet expressed a little peevishness from the neglect shown towards him by his friends in the country who though they knew well enough of his misfortunes yet they absolutely declined doing anything for him from a notion perhaps that it might reflect upon themselves above all things cartwright manifested a due sense of the ingratitude he had been guilty of towards so good a master as the gentleman whom he robbed had been to him he therefore prayed for his prosperity even with his last breath and declared he died without malice or ill-will against any person whatsoever at the place of his execution he attended very devoutly to the prayers but did not say anything to the people more than to beg of them to take warning by him after the rope was fixed about his neck he was executed at tyburn on monday the twenty first of september seventeen twenty six being then about twenty three years of age a remarkable instance of how far youth even of the best principles is liable to be corrupted if they are not carefully watched over and may justify those restraints which parents and masters from a just apprehension of things put upon their children or servants End of chapter 31chapter 32 of lives of the most remarkable criminals volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. Chapter 32. 
द लाइफ ऑफ फ्रांसिस एलियस मेरी ब्लैकेट अ हाईवे वुमेन नथिंग डिजर्व ऑब्जर्वेशन मोर दैन द रेजोल्यूशन और रैदर ऑब्सटिनेसी विथ विच सम क्रिमिनल्स डिनाई द फैक्ट दे हैव कमिटेड दो एवर सो एविडेंटली प्रूफ अगेंस्ट दैम देर आर टू एवल्स विच फॉलो फ्रॉम अ हेस्टी जजमेंट फॉर्मड फ्रॉम दिस कंसिडरेशन द फर्स्ट इज दैट पीपल आईदर इंस्टिगेटेड थ्रू मेलाइज और रैशली एंड बाई मिस्टेक स्वेर अगेंस्ट इनोसेंट पर्सनस फ्रॉम अ प्रिजम्पन दैट नबडी वुड बी सो विकेड एज टू डाई विद अ लाई इन देयर माउथ The other fault consists in imagining that the prosecutor is never in the wrong but believing that covetousness or revenge can never bring people to such a pitch as to take away the life of another to gain money or glut their passions our experience convinces us that either of these notions taken generally is wrong in itself and that even as many have died in the profession of falsehoods so some have suffered though innocent of the crime for which they died the true use therefore of this reflection is that where life is concerned too much care cannot be taken to sift the truth since appearances often deceive us and circumstances are sometimes strong where the evidence if the whole affair were known would be but weak mary blackett which was the real name of this unfortunate woman was the daughter of very mean parents who yet were so careful of her education that they brought her up to read and write tolerably well and to do everything which could be expected from a household servant which was the best station they ever expected she would arrive at when she grew big enough to go out they procured for her a service in which as well as in several others while a single woman she lived with very good reputation after this she married a sailor and for all her neighbors knew lived by hard working while he was abroad then on a sudden she was taken up and committed to newgate for assaulting william whittle in the highway and taking from him a watch value four pounds and six pence in money on the sixth of august seventeen twenty six when sessions came on the prosecutor appeared and sold the fact positively upon her whereupon the jury found her guilty though at the bar she declared with abundance of asseverations that she never was guilty of anything of that sort in her life and insisted on it that the man was mistaken in her face while under sentence of death she behaved herself with great devotion and seemed to express no concern at leaving the world excepting her only apprehensions that her child would neither be taken care of nor educated so well after her decease at the church of the parish as hitherto it had been yet with respect to the crime for which she was to die she still continued to profess her innocency thereof averring that she had never been concerned in injuring anybody by theft and charging the oath of the prosecutor wholly upon his mistake and not upon wilful design to do her prejudice at chapel as well as in the place of her confinement she declared she absolutely forgave him who had brought her to that ignominious end as freely as she hoped forgiveness from her creator and with this professions she left the world at tyburn on the same day with the before mentioned malefactor being then about thirty-four years of age persisting even at the place of execution in the denial of the fact end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three of lives of the most remarkable criminals volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lives of the most remarkable criminals volume two by arthur l hayward chapter thirty three the life of jane holmes alias barrett alias fraser a shoplifter in the summer of the year seventeen twenty six shoplifting became so common a practice and so detrimental to the shopkeepers that they made an application to the government for assistance in apprehending the offenders 
and in order thereto offered a reward and a pardon for any who would discover their associates in such practices it was not long before by their vigilance and warmth in carrying on the prosecution they seized and committed several of the most notorious shoplifters about town and at the next several ensuing sessions convicted six or seven of them which seems to have pretty well broke the neck of this branch of thieving ever since the malefactor of whom we are now speaking pretended to have been the daughter of a gentleman of some rank in a northern county certain it is that the woman had had a tolerable education and neither in her person nor in her behaviour betrayed anything of vulgar birth yet those whom she called her nearest relations absolutely disowned her on her application to them and would not be prevailed on to take any steps whatsoever in order to procure her a reprieve when between fifteen and sixteen years old she came up to london to her aunt as she asserted much against the will of her relations at that time she was not ugly and therefore a young man in the neighbourhood began to be very assiduous in his courtship to her hoping also that the persons she talked of as her father and brothers in the country would give him a sum of money to set up his trade miss jenny was a forward lass and the fellow being a spruce young spark soon prevailed over her affections and they were accordingly privately married though it proved not much to her advantage for her husband finding no money come began to use her indifferently upon which she fell into that sort of business which goes under the name of a holland trader and gave the best opportunities of vending goods that are ill come by at a tolerable price and with little danger whether in the lifetime of this husband or afterwards i cannot say but she fell into the acquaintance of the famous jonathan wilde and possibly received some of his instructions in managing her affairs in the disposal of stolen goods but as jonathan's friendships were mostly fatal so in about a year's time afterwards she was apprehended upon that score and shortly after was tried and convicted and thereupon ordered for transportation she continued abroad for two years or somewhat more and then under pretence of love to her children ventured over to england again where it was not long before she got acquainted with her old crew who if they were to be believed upon their votes were inferior to her in the art or mystery of shoplifting however it were whether by selling stolen goods or by stealing them certain it is she ran into so much money that an irish sharper thought fit about christmas before her death to marry her in order to possess himself of her effects which without ceremony he did upon her being last apprehended disposing of everything she had and taking away particularly a large purse of old gold which by her industry she had collected against a rainy day the woman who became an evidence against her soared so positively on the several indictments and what she said was corroborated with so many circumstances that the jury found her guilty on the four following indictments viz for stealing twenty yards of straw ground brocaded silk value ten pounds the goods of john moon and richard stone on the first of june seventeen twenty six of stealing in the shop of mr matthew herbert forty years of pink coloured mantua silk value ten pounds on the first of may in the same year of stealing in company with mary robinson a silver cup of the value of five pounds the goods of elizabeth Robinson on the seventh january of stealing in the company of mary robinson aforesaid eighty yards of cherry-coloured mantua silk value five pounds the goods of joseph born and mary harper on the twenty fourth december notwithstanding the clearness of the evidence given against her while under sentence of death she absolutely denied not only the several facts of which she was convicted but of her having been ever guilty of any theft during the whole life yet she confessed her acquaintance with jonathan wilde nay she went so far as to own having bought stolen goods and disposing of them by which she had got great sums of money she was exceedingly uneasy at the thoughts of dying and left no method untried to produce a reprieve 
venting herself in most opprobrious terms against some whom she would have put upon procuring it for her by pretending to be their near relation though the people knew very well that she had nothing to do with them or their family and she herself had been reproved her for nuking such pretensions by the ministers who assist condemned persons yet she still persisted therein and on the ordinary of newgate's acquainting her that the gentleman she called her father died the week before suddenly she fell into a great agony of crying and as soon as she came a little to herself reproached though in very modest terms the unnatural conduct of those she still affirmed to be so nearly related to her nothing could be more fond than she was of her children who were brought to newgate to see her and over whom she wept bitterly and expressed great concern at her not having saved wherewith to support them in their tender years at last when she lost all hopes of life instead of growing calmer and better reconciled to death as is frequent enough with persons in that sad condition on the contrary she became more impassioned than ever flew out into excessive passions and behaved herself with such vehemency and flights of railing that she did not a little disturb those who lay under sentence in the same place with her for this she was reprimanded by the keepers and exhorted to alter her behaviour by the minister of the place which had at last so good an effect upon her that she became more quiet for the two or three last days of her life in which she possessed herself exceedingly grieved for the many offences of her misspent life declaring she heartily forgave the woman who was an evidence against her and who she believed was much wickeder than herself because as this criminal pretended she had varied not a little from the truth at the place of execution she was more composed than could have been expected and with many prayers that her life might prove a warning to others she yielded up her last breath at tyburn on the same day with the before-mentioned malefactors being then about thirty-four years of age End of chapter thirty three chapter thirty four of lives of the most remarkable criminals volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. lives of the most remarkable criminals volume two by arthur l hayward chapter thirty four the life of catherine fitzpatrick alias green alias boswell a notorious shoplift after once the mercers had got burton who was the evidence into their hands she quickly detected numbers of her confederates several of whom were apprehended and chiefly on her evidence convicted amongst the rest was this catherine fitzpatrick who was born in lincolnshire of parents far from being in low circumstances and who were careful in bestowing on her a very tolerable education in the country she discovered a little too much forwardness and though london was a very improper place yet hither her friends sent her where she quickly fell into such company as deprived her of all sentiments where she quickly fell into such company as deprived her of all sentiments either of virtue or honesty what practices she might pursue before she fell into shoplifting i have not been able to learn and will not therefore impose upon my readers at the expense of a poor creature who is so long ago gone to answer for her offences which as they were doubtless many of themselves so they shall never be increased by me being a woman of a tolerable person notwithstanding her not having the best of characters she got a man in the mind to marry her to whom she made an indifferent good wife and though he was not altogether clear from knowing of her being concerned with shoplifters yet he was so far from giving her the least encouragement therein that they were on the contrary continually quarrelling upon this subject and whenever from any circumstances he guessed she had been thieving he beat her severely yet all this was to no purpose she still continued to treat in the old path and associated herself with a large number of women 
who were at this time busy in stealing silks out of the shops either in the absence of the master or under the pretence of seeing others it is observable not only of catherine fitzpatrick of whom we are now speaking but also of all the persons who died for this offence that they were extremely shy of making detailed confessions though ready enough to confess in general that they had been grievous sinners and that the punishment they were to undergo was very just from the hand of god fitzpatrick as well as the former criminal holmes charged burton the evidence with disingenuity in what she delivered on her vote against them and yet fitzpatrick could not absolutely deny having been guilty of a multitude of offences as to shoplifting so that it is highly probable even if the evidence erred a little in immaterial circumstances that in the main she swore truth the particular facts on which fitzpatrick was convicted were one stealing nineteen yards of green damask valued at nine pounds the goods of joseph gifford and john ravenel on july the twenty ninth seventeen twenty four two taking ten yards of green satin out of the shop of john moon and richard stone value three pounds on the tenth of february seventeen twenty four or seventeen twenty five three stealing in company with another person fifty yards of green mantua value ten pounds the goods of john out may the fifth seventeen twenty five four stealing sixty three years of modena and pink italian mantua the goods of joshua ferry february twenty four seventeen twenty four or seventeen twenty five these dates were all of them somewhat more than a twelve month before the time of her apprehension and she insisted on it that she had left off committing any such thing for a considerable space which made the evidence envy her and so brought on the prosecution as she was a woman of good natural parts and had not utterly lost that education which had been bestowed upon her she was not near so much confuted at the apprehension of death as people in her circumstances usually are she said she was glad she had some reformation in her life before this great evil came upon her because she hoped her repentance was the more sincere as it had not proceeded from force yet she was very desirous of life when first condemned and like mrs holmes pleaded her belly in hopes her pregnancy might have prevented her execution but a jury of matrons found neither of them to be quick with the child yet both to the time of their death effort they were so and seemed exceedingly uneasy that their children should die violent deaths within them when the time of her execution drew very near she called her thoughts totally off from worldly affairs and seemed to apply herself to the great business which lay before her with an earnestness and assiduity seldom to be seen in such people the assistance she had from her friends abroad were not large but she contented herself with a very severe diet being unwilling that anything should call her off from penitence and religious duties she seemed to have entirely weaned her affections from the desire of life and never showed any extraordinary emotions except on the visit of her youngest child in the nurse's arms at the first sight of which she fell into strong convulsion fits from which she was not brought to herself without great difficulty she sometimes expressed a little uneasiness at the misfortunes which had befallen her after she had left off that way of leaving but upon her being spoken to by several reverend persons who explained and vindicated the wisdom and justice of providence she acquiesced under its decrees and without murmuring submitted to her fate a little before she died she with the rest of the shoplifters was asked some questions concerning one mrs susanna who was suspected of having been in some degree concerned with her mrs fitzpatrick and mrs holmes each of them declared that they knew nothing at all about her mrs fitzpatrick did indeed say that she had some little acquaintance with the woman and knew that she got her living by selling coffee tea and some other little things yet never was concerned in any ill practices in relation to them or anybody else she knew of 
After having done this public justice, she, with great meekness, yielded up her writ at Tyburn, the 6th of September, 1726, being then about 38 years of age. End of chapter 34《Chapter Thirty Five of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume Two》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume Two》by Arthur L. Hayward. Chapter Thirty Five: The Life of Mary Robinson, a Shoplift. The indiscretions of youth are always pitied, and often excused, even by those who suffer most by them. But when persons grown up to years of discretion continue to pursue with eagerness the most flagitious courses, and grow in wickedness as they grow in age, pity naturally forsakes us, and they appear in so execrable a light that instead of having compassion for their misfortunes, we congratulate our country on being rid of such monsters, whom nothing could tame nor the approach even of death in a natural way hindered them from anticipating it by drawing on a violent one through their crimes i am drawn to this observation from the fate of the miserable woman of whom we are now speaking what her parents were or what her education it is impossible to say since she was shy of relating them herself and being seventy years old at the time of her execution there was nobody then leaving who could give an account about her she was indicted for stealing a silver cup in company with jane holmes and also stealing eighty yards of cherry-coloured mantua silk value five pounds in company with the aforesaid jane holmes the property of joseph brown and mary harper on the twenty fourth of december on this fact she was convicted as the rest were in the evidence of burton whom as is usual in such cases they represented as a woman worse than themselves and who had drawn many of them into the commission of what she now deposed against them as to this old woman mary robinson she said she had been a widow fourteen years and had both children and grandchildren living at the time of her execution she said she had worked as hard for her living as any woman in london yet when pressed thereupon to speak the truth and not wrong her conscience in her last moments she did then declare she had been guilty of thieving tricks but persisted in it that the evidence burton had not been exactly right in what she had sworn against her it was a melancholy thing to see a woman of her years and who really wanted not capacity brought into those lamentable circumstances and going to a violent and ignominious death when at a time when she could not expect it would be any long term before she submitted to a natural one possibly my readers may wonder how such large quantities of silk were conveyed away i thought therefore proper to inform them that the evidence burton said they had a contrivance under their petticoats not unlike two large hooks upon which they laid a whole roll of silk and so conveyed it away at once while one of their confederates amused the people of the shop in some manner or other until they got out of reach and by this means they had for many years together carried on their trade with great success and as much safety until the losses of the tradesmen ran so high as to induce them to take the method before mentioned which quickly produced a discovery not only of the persons of the offenders but of the place also where they had deposited the goods by this means a good part of them were recovered and those who had so long lived by this infamous practice were either detected or destroyed so that shoplifting has been thereby kept under ever since or at least the offenders have not ventured in so large a way as before but to return to the criminal of whom we are to treat she said she was not afraid of death at all though she confessed herself troubled as to the manner in which she was to die and reflected severely upon burton who had given evidence against her by degrees she grew calmer and on the day of her execution appeared more composed and cheerful than she had done during all her troubles she suffered 
at the same time with the malefactors before mentioned and in her years looked as if she had been the mother of those with whom she died end of chapter 35chapter 36 of lives of the most remarkable criminals volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org lives of the most remarkable criminals volume 2 by arthur l hayward chapter 36 the life of jane martin alias lloyd a cheat and a thief etc this woman was the daughter of parents in very good reputation about an hundred miles off in the country while they lived they took care to breed her to understand everything as become a gentlewoman of a small fortune and in her younger years she was tractable enough but her parents dying while jane was but a girl she came into the hand of guardians who were not altogether so careful as they ought before she was of age she married a young gentleman who had a pretty little fortune which he and she quickly confounded insomuch that he became a prisoner in the king's bench for debt being thus destitute and in great want of money she set her wits to work to consider ways and means of cheating people for her support in which she became as dexterous as any who ever followed that infamous trade yet her husband as she herself owned was a man of strict honour and so much offended at these villainies that he used her with great severity thereupon but that had no effect for she still continued the old trade putting on the saint until people trusted her and pulling off the mask as soon as she found there was no more to be got by keeping it on amongst the rest of her adventures in this way she once took it in her head that it was possible for her to set up a great shop entirely upon credit for except some good clothes she had nothing else to go to market with accordingly she first took a shop not far from somerset house and having caused some bales of brickbats to be made up sent them thither in a cart with one of her confederates which was safely deposited in that which was to pass for the warehouse a carpenter was sent for who was employed in making shelves drawers and other utensils for a haberdasher's shop then going to the wholesale people in that way she found means to draw them into six or seven hundred pounds worth of goods to the house which she had taken all of this stuff the saturday night following she caused to be carried over into the mint a practice very common with the infamous shelterers there who preserve their pretended privileges mrs martin having got some acquaintance in a tolerable family and having a very fair tongue she quickly huddled them into a belief of her being able to do great matters by her interest with some person of distinction whose name she made use of on this occasion and thereby got several presents and small sums of money and if she herself were to be believed among the rest a silver cup whether her falling in her promises really provoked the people to swearing a theft upon her or whether which is more probable she took an opportunity of conveying it secretly away certain it is that for this she was prosecuted and the fact appearing clear enough to the jury was thereupon convicted and ordered for transportation this afflicted her at least as much as if she had been condemned to instant death and therefore she applied herself continually to thinking which way it might be eluded and she might escape soon after her going abroad she effected what she so earnestly desired and unhappily for her returned again into england the numerous frauds she had committed had exasperated many people against her who as soon as it was rumoured that she was come back again never left searching for her until they found her out and got her committed to newgate and on the record of her conviction being produced the next sessions and the prosecutor swearing positively that she was the same person the jury after a short consultation brought her in guilty and she received sentence of death from which as she had no friends she could not hope to escape when she found death was inevitable she fell into excessive agonies and well nigh into despair the reflection on the many people she had injured gave her so great grief and anxiety of mind that she could scarce 
be persuaded to get down a sufficient quantity of food to preserve her life until the time of her execution but the minister at newgate having demonstrated to her the wickedness and the folly of such a course she by degrees came to have a better sense of things her mind grew calmer and though her repentance was accompanied with sighs and tears yet she did not burst out into those lamentable outcries by which she before disturbed both herself and those poor creatures who were under sentence with her in this disposition of mind she continued until the day of her death which was on the twelfth of september seventeen twenty six being between twenty-seven and eight years of age in the company of the before-mentioned malefactors cartwright blackett holmes fitzpatrick robinson and william allison a poor country lad of about twenty-five apparently of an easy gentle temper who had been induced into the fact partly through covetousness and partly through want End of chapter thirty-six Chapter 37 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. Chapter 37 the life of timothy benson a highwayman amongst the number of those unfortunate persons whose memory we have preserved to the world in order that their punishments may become lasting warnings unto all who are in any danger of following their footsteps none is more capable of affording useful reflections than the incidents that are to be found in the life of this robber are likely to create he was the son of a sergeant's wife in the regiment of the Earl of Derby, but who his father was, it would be hard to say. His mother having had a long intrigue with one Captain Benson, and the sergeant dying soon after this child was born, she thought fit to give him the captain's name, declaring publicly enough that if it was in her power to distinguish, the captain must be his father certain it is that the woman acted cunningly at least for benson who had never had a child was so pleased with the boy's ingenuity that he sent him to a grammar school in yorkshire where he caused him to be educated as well as if he had been his legitimate son nothing could be more dutiful than tim was while a child the captain was continually vexed with long letters from the gentlewoman where he was boarded concerning master's fine person great parts and wonderful improvements which benson being a man of sense took to be such gross flattery that he came down to bellaby the village where the child was on purpose to take it away but mr tim upon his arrival appeared such a prodigy both in beauty and understanding that the old gentleman was perfectly ravished with him and whatever he might believe before vanity now engaged him to think the youth his son for this reason he doubled his care in providing for him and when he had made a sufficient progress at the grammar school he caused him to be sent over to leiden a university of which he had a great opinion timothy lost not any of his reputation in this change of climate but returned in three years time from holland as accomplished a young fellow as has been bred there for a long time he had but just made his compliments to his supposed father and received thirty guineas from him as a welcome to england before the old gentleman fell ill of a pleurisy which in four days time deprived him of his life and as he had no will his estate of three hundred pounds a year and about seven hundred pounds in money which he had lent out on securities, descended to his sister's son, as arrant a booby as ever breathed, and deprived him both of his present subsistence and future hopes. In this distressed condition, he took lodgings in a little court at the farther end of Westminster, 
He had a great number of good clothes, and as he then addicted himself to nothing so much as reading, he lived so frugally as to make a very tolerable appearance, and to pay everybody justly for about half a year, which so well established his credit in the neighbourhood that he was invited to the houses of the best families thereabouts, and might undoubtedly, if he had had his wits about him, have married some young gentlewoman thereabouts of a tolerable fortune. But happening to lodge over against a great mantua makers, he took notice of a young girl who was her apprentice, and happened to be a chandler's daughter at Hammersmith. The wench, whose name was Jenny, was really handsome and agreeable, but as things were circumstanced with him, nothing could be more ridiculous than that passion which he suffered himself to entertain for her. It was very probable that he might have had some transient amours before this, but Jenny was certainly the mistress to whom he made his first addresses and the real passion of his heart. The girl was quickly tempted by the person and appearance of her lover, and without inquiring too narrowly into his circumstances, would certainly have yielded to his passion, if marriage had been the thing at which he aimed. But he was an obstacle hard to get over. Tim looked upon himself to be irretrievably undone from the hour he entered into that state. At last he conquered that virtue which his mistress had hitherto preserved, and after they had fooled away a month or two together, at the expense of all he had, Tim found himself at last obliged to confess the truth of his circumstances, and by that confession brought a flood of grief upon his fair one, who had hitherto been unaccustomed to misfortunes. When they first came together, it was agreed between them to quit that part of the town where they were both known, and they afterwards lodged in a very pretty little house on the edge of Red Lion Fields. On the morning Tim made this discovery, his cash was reduced to a single crown. It is true he had abundance of things of value, but when once they began to go, he was conscious to himself that starving would be quickly their lot, and what added more to his misfortunes was that his mistress, amidst all her sighs and afflictions, declared she would rather continue with him than go home to her relations, though from the indulgence of a mother she did not doubt of meeting with a good reception. However, they came to this resolution, that Jenny should go and raise five guineas upon a diamond ring of his, and while she was gone on this errand, poor Benson sat leaning with his head upon his arm, in a window that looked towards the fields. Casting up his eyes by chance, he saw a gentleman walking up and down, as if for his diversion, whereupon a thought immediately struck him, that it would be an easy matter to rob him, and by his appearance it was not unlikely but that he might prove a good prize. Without reflecting, he resolved upon the thing, and putting on over his nightgown an old greatcoat which he had in his closet, and with a case of pistols in his breast, he slipped out at the garden gate without being perceived, and was up with him in an instant. Then, taking the button of his hat in his teeth, he mumbled out, Deliver, or you are a dead man. The gentleman, in great confusion, gave him a green purse of gold, and was going to pull his ring off his finger and his watch out of his pocket. But Tim stopped him and said he had enough, only commanded him to turn his back towards him and not to alter his position for fifteen minutes by his own watch. This the gentleman religiously observed, and Tim made all the haste he could through the garden into his own chamber, where, having hid the cloak at the back of the bed, he began to examine the value of the plunder, and found that the purse contained seventy guineas and two diamond rings, one a single stone, and a very fine one, the other consisting of seven, but small, and of no great value. 
These he went down and buried in the garden, having first burnt the purse in the fire. The hurry of the fact being over, he sat down once again in his own room, and had leisure to reflect a little on what he had done, which threw him into such an agony that he was scarce able to sit upon the chair. Shame at the villainy he had committed, the fear of being apprehended, and the apprehensions of Tyburn, gave so many wounds to his imagination, that he thought his former uneasiness a state of quiet for the pangs which he now felt, which were much more bitter, as well as of a very different nature from anything he had known before. In the midst of these terrors, he heard the voices of a great deal of company in his landlady's parlour. The hopes of being a little easy, where he had not so much opportunity of affrighting himself with his own thoughts, occasioned his going downstairs, and without well knowing what he did, he knocked at the parlour door, which when opened, the first thing which struck his eyes was the gentleman whom he had robbed, drinking a glass of water. This gave him such a shock that he had much to do to collect spirits enough to tell the gentlewoman of the house that he perceived she had company, and therefore would not intrude. But she, laying her hand upon his arm, said, Pray, Mr. Benson, walk in, as nobody here but a gentleman who has had the misfortune to be robbed in the field, the fright of which has put him into such a disorder that he desired to step in here, that he might have leisure to come a little to himself. Tim saw it was impossible for him to retreat, and so putting on the best face he was able, he came in and sat down. The landlady began then to inquire the circumstances of the robbery. Why, madam, replied he, I was walking there, as I generally do of a fine afternoon, in order to get a little fresh air, when a man came up all of a sudden to me, close muffled up in a green or blue greatcoat. In truth, I cannot say which. He clapped a pistol to my breast, and I gave him my purse, and my niece's two rings, one of which cost me four score guineas but three weeks ago. And as I was afraid he would murder me, I was going to give him this off my finger and my watch out of my pocket. But that the fellow said he had enough, and his leaving these surprised me almost as much as taking the rest. But what sort of a man was he? said she. Why, I think he was about that gentleman's height, added he, but I am so short-sighted that I question whether I should have known his face, even had it not been covered with his hat. Besides, I am so much taken with the rogue's generosity that I would not prosecute him if I had him in the room. This set Tim's heart so much at rest that he began to come to himself a little and asked the strange gentleman if he would not be so good as to drink a glass of wine. A bottle was sent for, and during the time they were drinking it, Jenny came in, and it being quite dark before they had finished, a coach was called and Mr. Benson offered to see the gentleman home, in order to which he was going upstairs to put on his clothes. But this the stranger would not permit, begging him to go as he was, upon which Jenny said, Then, my dear, I'll fetch your great coat. He had much ado to desire the gentleman to walk to the coach, and he'd go as he was, which he did accordingly, and after drinking a glass of citron water, with the lady whose rings he had stolen, he came home again as fast as the coach could carry him. Jenny was very melancholy at his return, and giving him three guineas, told him that it was all the pawnbroker would lend, and she had much ado to get that, as she was not known. Tim bid her be of good cheer, and said he hoped things would mend, and so they went to bed. Two or three days after, he took an opportunity of going out pretty early, and returning after dinner time, told her, with much seeming joy, that he had met with a gentleman whom he had been acquainted with at Leyden, and who, hearing of his father's death, had begged him to accept of twenty guineas, 
as a mark to his esteem. Jenny was in raptures at their good fortune, and went that afternoon and fetched the ring home, returning poor creature, with as much satisfaction as if she had received ever so much money. For the hopes of living quietly a month or two with the man she loved, dispelled all the apprehensions of poverty which she was before under. Tim, considering that this supply would not last always, and resolving with himself never to run such a hazard again, he began to beat his brains about the best method to be taken of getting money in an honest way. As he had been bred to no profession, notwithstanding the excellent education he had had, never was a man more at his wit's end. After a thousand schemes had offered themselves to his mind and were rejected, it came at last into his head that as he was tolerably versed in physic, it might not be impossible for him to get his bread by that. But how to get into practice? There was the difficulty. A little recollection helped him here. He had seen a quack doctor exhibit his medicines, with a panegyric on their good qualities, on his journey to London. He resolved, scandalous as the profession was, to venture upon it, rather than run the risk he had done before. This scheme doubtless cost him some trouble before he brought it to bear so as to give him any hopes of his putting it into execution. But having at last settled it as well as he could, he determined with himself to go down into some distant county and undertake it. In order to have his thoughts at greater liberty to resolve about it, he took a walk into the fields, and being very dry after his perambulation, he stepped into a little alehouse and called for a mug of drink. While he sat there, he heard two men discoursing upon the vast sums of money that was got by one smith, a practitioner in the very art which he was going to set up, and he found by them that the chief scene of smith's adventures had lain in Lincolnshire and thereabouts. So, without more ado, as all places were alike to him, he settled his intentions to go down to the same place, where he understood by the man that his quondam doctor had done some great cures and got a tolerable reputation. When he came home, he could not avoid appearing very thoughtful, and Jenny, fearful of some new disaster, would not let him rest until he had acquainted her fully with his design which he would not consent to do until she promised to comply with the proposal he was to make her, after he had revealed the secret she was so desirous to know. When he had told her his project, she next demanded what the condition was to which she had bound herself to yield. Benson replied that it was to remain at some place thirty or forty miles distant from where he intended to go that she might not be exposed to any inconveniences from that unhappy figure he saw himself obliged to make. It was with great reluctance that she ratified the consent he had given, but at length, after much persuasion, she again acknowledged he was in the right and promised to do as he would have her. Things being thus adjusted, nothing remained for him to do but to get ready for his journey and that his mate might be the less timorous of the event, he told her he had procured another supply of twenty-five guineas. His cloak bag was soon stored with such medicines as he thought proper, and having packed up a few practical books he thought he might have occasion for, he took a place for himself and Jenny, who passed for his wife, in the stage coach for Huntingdon, at a village near which, paying the people for a month's board, he left his consort, and having hired horses to Boston, he took a young fellow from Huntingdon with him thither. As Benson had a very smooth tongue, so he set off the wonderful properties of his drugs in so artful a manner that in the space of a fortnight he had cleared ten pounds besides his expenses. As he had left Jenny five guineas in her pocket, 
he wrote to her to pay the people another month's board and assured her that he would return within that space hiring accordingly visited sleaford and some other great towns thereabouts in seven weeks time he set out for his return into huntingdonshire with fifty guineas all clear gain in his pockets this good luck encouraged him to run through the greatest part of the north of england in the same manner and within the compass of three years he cleared upwards of five hundred pounds at the time of his making this calculation he was set down at bristol in order to exercise his talent in that great city but an unexpected accident broke all his measures just as his stage was set up and he mounted and opening his harangue which was now become familiar to him a constable stepped up upon the stage and told him that a gentleman had sworn a robbery directly against him and he must go immediately before the mayor this put him into a lamentable confusion he knew himself innocent but the character of a mountebank was sufficient to make the thing believed at first and therefore he could not be blamed for his apprehensions especially considering he took it as a just return for that robbery which he had committed in town and for which he made no satisfaction when it was so fully in his power upon his prosecutors appearing before the mayor and swearing flatly to his face as to his robbing him of seven guineas a silver watch and a snuff-box tim had his mittimus made for newgate but upon his desiring the mayor that his effects might be searched but not plundered he had leave given him to return with the officer and see them looked over at the inn as many of them were valuable of themselves as the drugs were of the best sorts and as he had several letters from persons of good character in the several counties through which he had passed and banknotes and bills to the value of four hundred pounds they thought fit to report all this to the mayor before they did anything the mayor thereupon resolved to act very cautiously and having first looked over everything himself he then ordered the effects to be delivered up to mr benson himself who however was obliged to undergo a confinement of eight weeks till the assizes the prosecutor not appearing and mr benson by permission of the court examining two gentlemen of undoubted credit who proved to his being at the time when the robbery was sworn in another place he was acquitted and a copy of his indictment ordered him it seems a person under condemnation at hartford acknowledged the fact for which tim had been committed and produced both the snuff-box and watch which though the gentleman who lost them got again yet it proved an affair of very ill consequence to him for he was obliged to give benson one hundred guineas to obtain a general release and tim fearing the noise of the thing had undone his reputation resolved to go over to america and settle there a gentleman at bristol who traded largely to the plantations offered him his assistance in the affair and matters being quickly adjusted between them tim to show himself grateful and a man of honour was married privately to jenny whom he resolved should be the companion of his future fortunes as she had hitherto been the constant solace of all his sorrows but before they set out he thought it proper to make a journey to london as well as to provide some necessary articles in the profession he intended to follow as to make an end of a little affair which we have before related and which lay very hard upon his conscience to town then came jenny and he and took a lodging near tower street where in about a fortnight's time mr benson had put everything in order for his voyage the day before he set out on his return for bristol he wrote the following letter to the old gentleman he had robbed and who as he informed himself was still living in the same place sir under the pressure of severe necessity my misfortunes tempted me to commit so great a piece of villainy as the robbing you in red lion fields you may remember sir that i took from you a green purse 
in which were seventy guineas and two diamond rings, the one of a large, the other of a less value. The first comes to you enclosed in this. The latter, the same necessity which urged me so far as to take them, obliged me some months after to dispose of, which I did for fourteen pounds. As a satisfaction for the injury I did you, be so good, sir, as to accept of the enclosed note of one hundred pounds, which I hope will amount to the whole value of those things I took from you. And may I flatter myself, procure your pardon, the only thing wanting to making him easy, who is, sir, your most obedient, humble servant. This he took care to convey by a ticket porter, of whose fidelity he was well assured, and having dispatched this affair, he let slip nothing to make his intended voyage successful. His skill in his profession was such that he soon had as much business in the plantation where he settled as he knew what to do with, and in seven or eight years' practice acquired such an estate as was sufficient to furnish him with all the necessaries of life upon which he lived when he gave this account to the gentleman who communicated it to me. And as it is an instance of a return of virtue not often to be met with, I thought it might be as useful as any other relation which hitherto had a place in this confession. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April six zero nine zero, California, United States of America. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume two, by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of Joseph Shrewsbury, alias Smith, a robber, etc. This unhappy criminal, of whom we are now to speak, was the son of parents in so mean circumstances that they were not able to give him any education at all. Yet they were careful in carrying him constantly to church with them and instructing him, as far as they were able, in the principles of the Christian faith, and did everything that narrow capacity would give them leave in order to enable him to get his bread in some honest employment. Then they put him out apprentice to a tanner, in the neighborhood, a very honest, considerate man, who treated him with all the indulgence and kindness he could have wished throughout the time of his apprenticeship. But he was so unfortunate as to fall into the company of a set of giddy young people who were totally addicted to merrymaking and dancing, which when he had once got into the road of, he so neglected his business that his master, after abundance of reproofs, was obliged to part with him. He had not at that time any designs of doing anything like the fact for which he afterwards suffered, but continuing still to frequent his dancing mate's company. They promised to put him into a road to supply him with money enough to live without working, provided he had courage to do as they would have him, and he, without considering what he did, giving consent to their motions, went out one evening with David Anderson, Country Will, and Jenny Austin, and after a while they stripped one Thomas Collier, and robbed him of his coat and waistcoat, hat, and a pair of silver buckles, and other things, with a half guinea in gold, and twenty-five shillings in silver. For this offense he was quickly after committed, apprehended, and sent to Newgate, whereupon, a plain proof, he was convicted and ordered for execution. When the poor man was under sentence of death, he sufficiently repented those idle hours he had consumed in dancing, and in other merriments into which he had been led by his companions. He was now sensible how easily he might have lived if he had taken the advice of his kind master, who with so much pains endeavored not only to instruct him in his profession, but also to reclaim him from those follies in which he saw him engaged. The thoughts of death threw him into violent agonies from whence his natural sense, of which he had a great deal, at last in some measure recovered him, and when upon the coming down of the death warrant, he saw there were no hopes left for him in this life, 
he applied himself with very great ardency to secure happiness in the next he declared that the fact for which he died was the first ever he committed and that the depositions against him were not exactly conformable to truth a day or two before his death he appeared to be very calm and very cheerful submitted with a perfect resignation to the lot which had befallen him and at the place of execution exhorted the people not to let their curiosity only be satisfied in the sight of his wretched death but he warned them also from the commission of such crimes as might bring them to a like fate he suffered on the third of november seventeen twenty six at tyburn being then about twenty two years of age End of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of lives of the most remarkable criminals volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. Chapter 39. The Life of Anthony Drury, a Highwayman. This unfortunate man, whose fate made a great noise in the town at the time it happened, was born of parents neither mean in family nor fortune, in the county of Norfolk, where he received his education, on which no little pains and expense were bestowed. As to the particular circumstances of his life in his most early years, as no exact accounts have come to my hands, so i do not think myself obliged to frame any adventures for the entertainment of my readers a practice very common yet i think unjustifiable in itself all that i can is that it appears he lived at oxford and Bicester before he came to wendover at which place he had a house and family at the time of his death he was not as far as i am able to learn bred up to any particular profession whatever his parents leaving him in circumstances capable of supporting himself. However, whether he arrived at it after some misfortunes, or had it discovered to him before, certain it is that he gained some knowledge in the act of curing smoking chimneys, by which he got very considerably, and from whence be derived the name of the Smoky Chimney Doctor, by which he was commonly known in the county of Bucks. Some few years before his death, he married a widow gentlewoman at Oxford of a considerable fortune. The world, though something too largely, reported that she had fifteen hundred pounds. However it were, he still addicted himself to women, and in all probability made her but an indifferent husband, since she took so little care about him when in the midst of so great calamities. However it were, he maintained a tolerable character in the neighbourhood, and his credit had not been impeached in any degree when he committed the fact I am going to relate. On the 25th of September, 1726, he attacked the Bister wagon as it was coming from London, and committed the following robberies therein, viz. He took from Thomas Eldridge 15 moidores, 210 guineas, 80 half guineas, and the goods and money of Mr. Burroughs. He was likewise indicted and found guilty for assaulting Sarah, the wife of Robert King, on the highway, and robbing her of two shillings and sixpence. As likewise on a third indictment, for assaulting the aforesaid Thomas Eldridge, and taking from him a calico gown and petticoat, value 20 shillings the goods of Giles Betts. There was a fourth indictment against him for assaulting Mary, the wife of Joseph Page, and taking from her two shillings and sixpence. But the three former being all capital, the court did not think proper to try him upon this. While he lay under sentence of death, he did not discover any signs of excessive fear, but appeared rather perplexed and confused than dispirited or dejected. 
he entertained at first great hopes of a reprieve at least in order to be transported and for obtaining it he spent a great deal of time writing to several friends who he thought might be instrumental in procuring it however he was far from neglecting the concerns of his soul but read daily with much seeming diligence several little books proper for a man in his condition and whenever he attended at chapel behaved with the utmost gravity praying if we may guess from exterior signs with much fervour and devotion he was a man very well acquainted with the principles of the christian religion and was in all appearance better persuaded of the merit and efficacy of his saviour's passion than people often are in his condition as to his capacity it appeared to have been very tolerable in itself and to have received many advantages from education how he acquired the art of curing smoky chimneys is not very well known he having been bred up to no trade whatsoever but coming into the world with a little fortune left him by his parents he lived thereupon with a tolerable reputation until the time of his marriage when he was first under sentence he was very desirous of having his wife come to town and for that purpose wrote her several pressing letters to which he received no answer this gave him great disturbance he thereupon wrote to a friend in the country who lived near her on whom also he had a strong dependence entreating him to go to his wife and solicit her not absolutely to desert him in his extreme calamity but to come up to town with him in order to make their last efforts for his preservation this epistle however proved in the main as unsuccessful as the rest though it procured him an answer wherein the person he wrote to informed him that his wife was extremely lame insomuch that she could not put on her own clothes that her servant was gone that she had no money wherewith to defray the expenses of a journey to town much less to assist him in his distress as for himself his friend excused his coming by reason of a great cold which he had caught in london when he came up before to attend mr drury's affairs hereupon the unfortunate criminal bethought himself of another expedient which he imagined would not fail of engaging mrs drury to come to london he informed her by letter that in the beginning of his troubles he had pawned some silver plate in town for four and twenty pounds that it was more than double the value and might probably be lost on his death to this his friend wrote him back that if anybody would take the plate out and give advice thereof to mrs drury she would repay them and gratify them also for their trouble when this letter came to the poor man's hand he said he was satisfied that his wife did not desire he should live however he heartily forgave her he constantly denied that he had ever been concerned in any act of a like kind with that for which he died he acknowledged that with what his wife had and the business he followed he might have lived very genteelly in the country that he had not indeed been very prudent in the management of his affairs however it was no necessity that forced him on the base and wicked act for which he died the sole cause of his committing which was as he solemnly protested the repeated solicitations of king the wagoner who for a considerable time before represented the attempt to him as a thing no way dangerous in itself and which would bring him a very large sum of ready money as soon as king perceived that his insinuations begun to make some impression he opened himself more fully as to the facility of robbing the bister wagon wherein says he you will find generally a pretty handsome sum of money and as to opposition depend on it you shall meet with none at last these speeches prevailed on him and it was agreed that the wagoner should have half the booty for his advice and assistance and the better to conceal it drury was directed to rob king's wife of about four pounds 
which was all she had about her. A minister of the Church of England, who was either acquainted with Mr. Drury, or out of charitable intention, attended him at the request of his friends, took abundance of pains to give him just notions of his duty in that unfortunate slate into which his folly had brought him. He repeated to him the reasons which render a public confession necessary from those who die by judgment of the law. He exhorted him not to equivocate or even extenuate in his declarations concerning his offence. Mr. Drury heard him with great patience, seemed to be much affected with the remonstrances which were made to him, and finally promised that he would act sincerely in the confessions he made to the public, adding that he had none in whom to trust but God alone, and therefore he would not offend him. The Reverend Divine to whom he spoke approved his resolution and promised to afford him all the assistance in his power till death. As soon as the criminal was satisfied that all applications that had been made for mercy were ineffectual, and that there was not the least probability of a pardon, he immediately sent for the clergyman before mentioned, and desired to receive the sacrament at his hands, to which the gentleman readily assented, uttering only a short previous exhortation unto a true repentance, open and genuine confession, and full and free forgiveness unto all who had ever injured him, or unto whom he bore any ill will. Mr. Drury, therefore, before he received the elements, owned in express terms his being guilty of the fact for which he died, affirmed the truth of what he had formerly said concerning the wagoner, declared that he forgave both him and his own wife sincerely, and that having now in some measure eased his mind, he was no longer afraid of death. Mr. Drury, even after receiving sentence, was indulged by the keepers of Newgate in having a room to himself in the press yard, which afforded him leisure and privacy for his devotions, and he seemed, especially for the last days of his life, to make proper use of those conveniences by excluding himself from all company and applying earnestly to God in prayer for the forgiveness of his sins. During the two or three days succeeding that whereon he received sentence, a gentlewoman attended pretty constantly upon him. Who she was, we can neither say, nor is it very material. But Mr. Drury, appealing to her in the presence of some persons, as to the truth of what he alleged concerning King the Wagoner, she desired to relate what she knew as to that point. The account she gave was to this purpose. Mr. Drury carried me out of town with him in a chaise to Wendover. On the road we were met by the wagoner he speaks on, who desired Mr. Drury to step out, for he wanted to speak with him. Thereupon he complying with the wagoner's request, they walked together to a considerable distance, and there stopping, talked to each other very earnestly for some time. As to the subject of their discourse, she declared she could say nothing, but as they came back to the chaise, the wagoner said, You need not be afraid, you will be sure to get what you want. To say truth, it was very odd for a single man to rob a wagon to which so many people belonged, in company with several other wagons, without any opposition, though it be likewise true that he did not attempt any of the rest. Some persons of quality were prevailed on by his earnest solicitations and the circumstances we have before mentioned to endeavour the procuring him a pardon, but it was in vain, and it would certainly have been much better for the man if he never had any hopes given him, for though he did not depend as much on promises, as men in his miserable condition frequently do, yet the desire of life sometimes excited the hopes of it, and thereby took off his thoughts from more weighty concerns, or at least made him more languid and confused than other ways he would have been, for the very day before his death he still entertained some expectations of mercy. The evening before 
he suffered a woman knocked at his chamber door and earnestly desired to speak a few words to him. He accordingly came towards the door and asked her what it was she would have to say to him. The woman, after expressing much sorrow for his misfortunes, told him she was desired by a person to whom she had been servant, if the thing were possible, to learn from his own mouth what he had to say against the wagoner. Mr. Drury replied that he had never had any thought of robbing wagons or any such thing if the wagoner had not advised and pressed him to it, so that his blood, the loss of his life, and all he had in the world lay upon that man. Then, shutting the door, he returned to his devotions and continued to them all the evening and until the night was considerably spent. As death drew near, it seemed not to affect him as much as might be expected. On the morning of his execution, he appeared not only easy, but cheerful, attended at the prayers at chapel with much composure, and went out of Newgate without any sign of fright or disturbance of mind. On the road to Tyburn, he appeared serious but melancholy, spoke a good deal concerning the errors of his former life, said he had never been addicted to drinking, but had conversed too much with bad women, which had made his wife jealous and caused home to be very uneasy. He seemed truly penitent for these offences, as he confessed them without any questions being asked by those about him. At the place of execution, his courage did not forsake him. He still preserved a great deal of serenity in his countenance and when he was desired to acquaint the people with anything he had to say concerning the crime for which he died, he spoke with a strong voice and repeated what he had formerly alleged about King the Wagoner, adding that he advised him also to rob the Banbury wagon. And that notwithstanding, he talked of his wife's having four pounds about her, yet he took but three shillings, whereupon the third indictment was founded on which he was convicted. He then complained of his wife's unkindness and both prayed for the spectators and desired their prayers for him. As he was leaning on the side of the cart, the ordinary told him that a man had charged him the day before with having married a man's daughter at Norwich, who is still living. Mr. Drury answered, he was reproached by many people and he forgave them all. He then called to a gentleman who was near the gallows and spoke to him about his estate, which he had before settled. Afterwards, he exhorted the people to live virtuously and be warned by his example, and then submitted patiently to his fate. On Thursday, the 3rd of November, 1726, being at that time of his decease about 28 years of age. End of chapter 39。Chapter 40 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2 。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson. Ames, Iowa. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of William Miller, a Highwayman, etc. As necessary correction is often a method by which, when young people begin to stray into the paths of vice, they are deterred and brought back again into the road of virtue, yet, when this is incautiously inflicted or done in a violent manner, it frequently excites worse thoughts than would otherwise probably have entered the breasts of young people thus punished, and instead of hindering them from committing trivial offences, puts them on doing the worst things imaginable in order to deliver them from a state more hateful to them than death itself. This criminal, William Miller, 
was the son of very honest parents who lived at Newcastle upon Tyne, who took care to give him a good education and what was much more commendable, a good example. They put him out apprentice to a tradesman at Annick, with whom he might have lived tolerably well had it not been for the churlishness of his master's temper, who was continually picking quarrels with him, and thereupon beating him inhumanly. At last an accident happened which supplied a continual fund of anger and resentment, and this was on account of William's losing a horse, which, though his friends paid for, yet every time it came into his master's head there was a battle between them, for Miller being now grown pretty big made resistance when he struck him, and not seldom got the better of him, and beat him in his turn. This occasioned such disturbances and falling out between them that at last Miller took a resolution for leaving him for good and all, and determined to live as he could, up and down the country. At first he was so lucky as to meet with a man who employed him readily, treated him with kindness, and gave him good advice, without accompanying his reproofs with blows. But upon discovering that his man William had not served out his time, but had only five years and a half with his master, he absolutely refused to suffer him to work any longer. It was with great reluctancy that Miller parted with this master, and he became every day after more and more uneasy, because he found no other master would let him work with them, upon the same account, so that by degrees he was reduced to the great necessity in the country, and though he was willing to work, yet could not tell which way to turn his hand. In the midst of these perplexities he bethought himself of coming up to London, which he put in execution. On his arrival there he listed himself as a soldier in one of the regiments of guards, and as it is no very hard matter in this town, got abundance of amorous affairs upon his hands. With one woman he lived a short time after his coming up to London, but her he soon turned off for the sake of another, who was a blacksmith's wife, and whom he married, notwithstanding her first husband was then to his acknowledge alive. This was indeed the source of a great part of his misfortunes, since what between the woman's drinking and the money which the husband got out of him for permitting him to live quietly with her, he was, notwithstanding he had learnt a new employment, videlis it that of a basket-maker, miserably poor. And the woman having brought him a child to increase his expenses, he was at last forced, whether he would or no, to leave her and it both. After this he associated with another woman, and at length married her also, with whom he lived quietly enough until the time of his death. These numerous intrigues drew him, in consequence, into a multitude of other vices, which both lost him his reputation and damaged his understanding, especially when he came to drink hard, which he at last did to such a degree that he was seldom or never sober, or, if he were, the reflecting on his misfortunes pushed him on getting drunk as fast as he could. A case but too common amongst the meaner sort of people, who, as they have no philosophy of learning to support them, endeavour to drown all care by sodding. Whether Miller really intended to go a-robbing at the time he committed the fact for which he died, or whether drunkenness and the sense, even in that condition which he retained of his misfortune, on a sudden suggested to him the stripping of the old man Nicholas born under the favour of the night, certain it is, though from motives we cannot determine, that he attacked the man and took from him his coat and hat.
On the injured person's crying out, a watchman ran immediately to his assistance, and with his pole, notwithstanding Miller drew his bayonet, knocked him down, and so seized him and delivered him up to justice. At the next sessions at the Old Bailey he was indicted for this fact, and the same was very fully and clearly proved against him. Yet though he had no friends capable of procuring him either a reprieve or pardon, he had the good luck to remain a considerable space under condemnation, videlicit it from one sessions to another, before the report was made, and so had the greater leisure left him for repentance. During the space he lay in the condemned hold he expressed a very hearty sorrow for all his offences and particularly regretted his having addicted himself so much to the company of women, which, as it at first led him into expenses, naturally brought him into narrow circumstances, and his necessities unfortunately put him upon taking the fatal method of supplying himself. Yet in the midst of these tokens of penitence and contrition several women came still about him, so he resolved to send the child he had by the second down to his friends in the country, not doubting, as he said, but that they would take care of it. And for the last of those who went for his wife, he really looked upon her as such, and therefore treated her with more kindness and affection than he did any of the rest. However, Doubtless they were no great help to him in his preparations for death. And amongst the other miseries produced, to our view, this is not a small one, that they continue to pursue us even to the last, and fasten so strongly about our thoughts and inclinations that as at first they defeated all consideration, so in the end they are in danger of preventing a hearty and sincere repentance. As to the particular fact for which he was to die, he acknowledged himself guilty thereof, but for all that objected to the several circumstances that were sworn against him at his trial. Nor could all the arguments that were used towards him persuade him that those trifling variations, for as he himself represented them they were no more, were not now at all material to him but that as he justly deserved to die according to his own confession, it signified little to him whether the particular steps taken in his apprehension were exactly stated by the court or not. As the day of his execution drew near, he receded a little from these objections, and began to set himself in earnest to acquire that calmness with which every reasonable man would desire to meet death. The women he forbade visiting him, refused to eat or drink anything but what was absolutely necessary to support nature, plied himself regularly and constantly to his devotions, and seemed to have nothing at heart but to reconcile himself to that divine being, who by the multitude of his crimes he had so much offended. To say truth, it was not a little wonderful that a person after continuing for such a length of time in the practice of wickedness and debauchery should at last be capable of applying himself with such zeal and attention to the duties of a dying man. He yielded up his life the 13th of February, 1727, at Tyburn, being then 26 years of age. End of chapter 40 Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa Chapter 41 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, 
by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of Robert Haynes, a Murderer, etc. As from a multitude of instances in the course of these memoirs it has been shown how great a misfortune it is to be destitute of education, so from the following life it will appear that an improper education is as dangerous as none at all. Robert Haynes, the criminal whose history we are to give at present, was the son of persons in Ireland, of none of the best circumstances, who yet afforded him a very good education, causing him to be instructed not only in the Latin, but also in the Greek tongue, in both of which to the day of his death he attained a tolerable knowledge. His father, it seems, though he had done everything for his son in breeding him a scholar, though when he grew up to man's estate he had nothing to give him, and was forced to let him come over to England to list himself in the foot guards. His officers gave him always the character of a quiet, inoffensive lad, who injured nobody, nor was himself addicted to those vices which are common to the men of his profession. On the contrary, he retained yet strong notions of those religious principles in which he had been educated. He addicted himself much to reading, and though his spirit was not a little broken by the consideration of that low life by which he was obliged to stoop, yet he preserved a becoming spirit and a very gentlemanlike behavior upon all occasions, so that the officers of his regiment very much regretted that misfortune which brought him to an untimely end. Of the occasion of this we come next to speak, since his youth and the regularity of his life prevented any other of his adventures coming to our notice. It happened one Sunday evening, as he was walking along St. James's Park with two other soldiers, they met two men and two women. Haynes unluckily kissed one of the women, upon which one of the men turned and broke his head. As was insisted even to the time of the death of this unfortunate person, the swords of both were drawn. However that were, he gave his antagonist a wound in the breast of which he died. For this he was apprehended and committed prisoner to Newgate. At the ensuing sessions of the Old Bailey he was indicted for willfully murdering Edward Perry by giving him a wound on the left part of the right breast near the short ribs, of the depth of twelve inches and of the length of one. He was also indicted a second time on the statute of stabbing, and a third time upon the coroner's inquest for willful murder. On all three of which, notwithstanding his defense and the witnesses he called, he was found guilty, and although some honorable persons took a great deal of pains to procure a pardon or reprieve for him, yet it proved of no purpose but he and the aforementioned malefactor were put into the death warrant and ordered for execution. For himself he had little hopes from the endeavors of his friends, and therefore behaved himself as if he had had none, being not only constant and devout at the public exercises in the chapel, but also ardent in his devotions in private and by himself. As the youth wanted not good sense, and had not forgot the education he had received in Ireland, so in every respect while under sentence of death he performed what could be expected from a man of courage and a Christian under his circumstances. A minister out of charity visited him several times and prayed with him exhorting him always to make a clear and candid confession of the fact and since there were no hopes not to go to death with a lie between his lips yet he persisted still in what he had at first declared 
and continued to assert the truth of that declaration until the jail sickness brought him so low that he was scarce able to speak at all in this low state of health he continued until within two or three days of his death when he began to pick up strength a little and as soon as he was able to go up the stairs he attended as usual the devotions of the chapel. In this frame and disposition of heart he remained until the day of his execution came, upon which he appeared not only calm but cheerful, received the sacrament as is usual with malefactors at the day of their death, and behaved at it in a very pious and religious manner. When he came to Tyburn he stood up, and intended to have spoken to the people, but finding himself too weak, he referred to a paper which he delivered to Mr. Appleby, a printer, and which contained the substance of what, if he had been able, he would have there spoken, and then, after a few private ejaculations, he easily resigned up his breath at the same time with the other malefactor being then in the one-and-twentieth year of his age. I thought proper to insert the copy of that letter I have before spoken of, and it follows verbatim. Good people, I am to suffer by law an ignominious death, God's will be done, which untimely end I never expected. I am a youth, and it's above twelve months since I enlisted into His Majesty's service. The character of my behavior in that time I will leave to my acquaintance to declare. My character was sufficiently testified at my trial by gentlemen of worth and honor. I pray God bless them for their Christian charity. I praise God my resolution to live uprightly was no constraint. As for the cause I suffer, and the horrid imputation I am charged with which is rendered murder, from my soul I abhor, I now declare as I expect salvation, I am unjustly accused. But I freely forgive my persecutors, as I hope to be forgiven. For what I did was accidental, and in my own vindication. The real truth is as follows. The two soldiers that were my evidence desired my company to drink with them. As we were returning home through the park, passing by two women and being warm with liquor, I presumed to give one of them a kiss. The other was a married woman and resenting my freedom, called out to her husband, Edward Perry deceased, and to Tom's that walked before, both entire strangers to me. They returned, Tom's advanced towards me speaking abruptly, and struck me over the head and shoulders with a stick, which stunned me. Likewise he urged the deceased to quarrel with me. The deceitful Perry enraged, swore he would see me out, and struck me with his sword in his scabbard over the head. He drew his sword and made several passes at me, I still retreated till provoked to draw my sword to preserve myself. This affair was in the night. I received a wound in my right hand thumb and a thrust through my coat. This I declare to be the whole truth as I shall answer before my great God, though my persecutors, Tom's and the deceased man's wife, swore quite the reverse which took place to my ruin. I pray God forgive them their trespasses, as I hope forgiveness for my own. I pray God bless my good Colonel for his care and endeavors for my safety. I pray God bless him with length of days and prosperity in all his undertakings. I thank God I never wronged man, woman, or child to my knowledge, nor was I ever inclined to quarrel. I heartily beg of God pardon and forgiveness for my sins. 
and I confide in the merits of my dear Saviour, who died for the world. I was baptized and bred a member of the Church of England, though an unworthy and unfortunate one, in which communion I hope for salvation through my blessed Redeemer. Sunday, February the 12th, 1726 Robert Haynes End of chapter 41 Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa Chapter 42 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. The Lives of Thomas Timms, Thomas Perry, and Edward Brown, Footpads. This poor unhappy man, Thomas Timms, was the son of mean parents in the country, and as indifferently educated as he was born, so that his future ill deeds were capable of some little extenuation. With much to do, his friends and parents raised money enough to put him out apprentice to a chair carver, with whom he lived easily and honestly during the space of his apprenticeship, coming out of it with the character of an honest religious young lad which he maintained after he was set up and married. He had probably continued to maintain it to the end of his life if he had not fallen into unhappy circumstances by being out of work. This obliged him to come up to town, where for a while he lived pretty well upon his business. But at last it so far fell off that he was obliged to list himself a soldier in the first regiment of guards. Notwithstanding this, he worked still at his trade, as much as it was possible for him to do and to perform his duty, but misfortune still crowding upon him, he grew at first melancholy, and at last took to drinking in the company of bad women, who soon drew him into thinking of taking dishonest methods to obtain money for the support of their debaucheries. Amongst other of his acquaintance, there was a woman who had formerly lived with a very eminent lawyer in the city. It was said she had a greater familiarity with her master than she ought to have had, from whence she took the liberty to cheat him most egregiously, especially by counterfeiting receipts from most of the tradesmen with whom her master had any dealing. By which means she retained in her own hands the money which she should have paid him. Some months after, however, the roguery was discovered, and her master being newly married, he took this opportunity to discharge her suddenly. However, he promised her, if she went into any lodgings and gave him notice, he would take care that she should not want until she could get herself into some way of business or other. This gentleman had three clerks all of good families and good fortunes. The wench, after she was out of the house, first went into a neighborhood where the eldest of these clerks and his relations were very well known. Here she took upon her to be his wife, and said that they were privately married for fear of disobliging his relations. By the help of this, she got so far into credit that she took up near a hundred and twenty pounds worth of things, before the least apprehension was had of her being a cheat. And then, removing her lodgings, she fixed herself in a first floor within a few doors of the guardian of her master's second clerk. She gave it out there as she had done before, that she was secretly married to this young gentleman, and on the credit thereof, she took up near a hundred pounds in silks and shifts. But just as she was on the point of moving off and playing the same game with the third, 
she was detected and committed to Bridewell. From thence she found means of escape by wheedling one of the keeper's servants, and afterwards took lodgings in the house where this Tim's worked. Whether she had any hand in persuading him to go out robbing or no, I cannot take upon me to say. But soon after, he, with his companions Perry and Brown, on the 3rd of May, went out with a design to rob upon Hounslow Heath. All that night they lay in the fields. The next morning they met a poor old man, who, telling them he had no money, they let him go without misusing him. Not long after they stopped Samuel Sells coming from Windsor in his chair. He, it seems, kept a public house there. Him they commanded to deliver, whereupon he gave them three half-crowns. But they toasting upon it that it was too little, he thereupon gave them ten shillings more, which both he and his companions averred was all that they took from him, though cells at their trial swore to a much larger sum, and that one of them held a truncheon over him, and threatened him with abundance of oaths in case he made any resistance. All of them denied this part of the charge even to death, and said that though they had truncheons, yet they made no use of them, but kept them either in their breasts or under their coats. Thomas Perry, the second of these malefactors, was born of parents in such wretched circumstances that when he was grown a good big lad, and death suddenly snatched them away, he found himself destitute of money, of business, and even of clothes to cover him. He thereupon travelled up to London, and put himself apprentice to a glass grinder, with whom he served his time very honestly and faithfully. Then he married and lived by working very hard in a reputable manner for about a twelve month, after which he listed in the first regiment of foot guards, in which he served till the peace of Utrecht and Flanders, after the conclusion of which he returned to London in the same regiment, in which he continued to serve till this misfortune overtook him. For the last year of his life he had, it seems, led a more loose and extravagant course than in all his days before, contracting an acquaintance with several women of the town, creatures who are the utter ruin of all such unhappy men, especially of all unlettered, unexperienced persons as fall into their snares. Some little time before he joined with Tim's and his other companion in this robbery, he had the misfortune of having his leg bit by a dog at Windsor where he was quartered. Having no friends, and but a small allowance to subsist on, he fell under great miseries there, and on his return to town, those who had formerly employed him in glass grinding, taking distaste at his rude and wicked behavior, refused to have anything more to do with him. He readily gave way to the solicitations of Tim's, who, as he declared, first proposed their going upon the highway, a crime which hitherto had not entered into Perry's head. However, he yielded too readily thereto, and with the persons who had shared in his crimes, came to share an ignominious and untimely death. While under sentence, he applied himself with great seriousness and attention both to the public devotions of the chapel and to what was privately read to them in the place of their confinement, so that though he was very illiterate, he was far from being obstinate, and though he wanted the advantages of education, he was not deficient in grace, so we may therefore hope he might obtain mercy." Edward Brown, the last of these unfortunate criminals, drew his first breath in the city of Oxford, and by the care of his parents, attained to a tolerable degree of knowledge in the Christian faith, and also in writing, reading, and whatsoever was necessary in that station of life which his parents designed for him. 
being arrived at an age proper to be put out an apprentice, they placed him with a glass grinder, to whom he served an apprenticeship faithfully, and to his good liking when out of time. He worked hard as a journeyman, married a wife, and lived in reputation and credit for some small space, but falling unluckily into loose company, he gave himself up entirely to drinking and running after bad women, which soon ruined him in the country and obliged him to come up to London for the sake of subsistence. How long he had been there, or of what standing his acquaintance was with the other two criminals, I cannot take upon me to say. Only he in general was a fellow of greater openness in his behavior than any of the criminals before mentioned. He said that they had all taken their cups pretty freely together, and had spent every farthing that they had amongst them. It was then resolved to go upon the highway for a supply, but he could not say who was the proposer of the scheme, that he himself had a sword and cane, and the rest truncheons, when they attacked Mr. Sells. He, Sells, gave them at two several times, seventeen shillings, and when they pressed for still more, said he had but eighteen pence about him, and begged they would let him have that to come to town with, which he said they agreed to, and did not offer him any ill usage whatsoever. At the same time these unhappy men were under sentence of death, Alexander Jones, John Platt, Mary Reynolds, Sylvia Sherlock and Anne Senior were also condemned for several offences, and as is but too common with persons in their condition, all of them entertained strong notions of reprieves or pardons, so that when the death warrant came down, and these three found themselves ordered for execution, they were not a little surprised. But as they had much natural courage, they made even that surprise turn to their advantage, and applied themselves with greater earnestness than ever to the duties necessary to be practised by people in their sad state. When the day of their execution came, they were carried in one cart to Tyburn, and as they had been companions in that single action which had brought all of them to death, so there was nobody to share in that unhappy fate with them, nor were they disturbed with the sorrows of other criminals, which often distract one another's devotions at Tyburn. On the contrary, their behavior was grave and decent, their public devotions were closed with a psalm, and with many demonstrations of repentance they resigned their lives on the 11th of August, 1727. Tim's being about twenty-eight years of age, Perry near forty, and Brown somewhat less than twenty-four years old at the time of their execution. End of chapter 42 Recording by Geoffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa Chapter 43 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. The Life of Alice Green, a Cheat, Thief, and Housebreaker. Amongst these melancholy relations of misery and death, I fancy it is some ease to my readers, as well as to myself, when the course of my memoirs leads me to mention a story as full of incidents, and followed by a less tragic end than the rest. This woman, whose life I am about to relate, was the daughter of an under-officer to one of the colleges at Oxford. As the doctrine of making up small salaries by taking up large perquisites prevails there as well as elsewhere, Alice's father made a shift to keep himself 
his wife and five children in a handsome manner out of sixty pounds a year, and what he made besides of his place. An affectation of gentility had infected the whole family. The old man had a good voice and played tolerably well on the fiddle. This drew abundance of the young smart fellows of the university to his house, and that of course engaged his three daughters to take all the pains they were able to make themselves agreeable. The mother had great hopes that fine clothes and a jaunty air might marry her daughters to some gentleman of tolerable fortunes, and that one of them at least might have a chance of catching a fellow commoner with a thousand or two per annum, for which reason Miss Molly, Miss Jenny, and Miss Alice were all bred to the dancing school, taught to sing prettily, and to touch the spinet with an agreeable air. In short, the house was a mansion of politeness, and except the two brothers, one of which was put out apprentice to a carpenter and the other to a shoemaker, there was not a person to be seen in it who looked, spoke, or acted as became them in their proper station of life. But it is necessary that we should come to a more particular description. Old Peter, their father, was a man of mean birth, and of a sort of accidental education. From his youth up he had lived in Oxford, and from the time he was able to know anything, within the purlieus of a college, from whence he had gleaned up a few Latin sentences, scraps of poetry, and as the masterpiece of his improvements, had acquired a good knack of punning. All these mighty qualifications were bent to keep a good house, and drinking two or three quarts of strong ale, accompanied with a song, and two or three hours scraping at night. The mother again was the last remnant of a decayed family, who charged its ruin on the civil wars. She was exceedingly puffed up with the notions of her birth, and the respect that was due to a person not sprung from the vulgar. Her education had extended no farther than the knowledge of preserving, pickling, and making fricassees, a pretty exact knowledge in the several kinds of points, and a judgment not to be despised in the choice of lace, silks, and ribbons. She affected extravagance that she might not appear mean, and troublesomely ceremonious that she might not seem to want good manners. Clothes for herself and her daughters, a good quantity of china and some other exuberances of a fancy almost turned mad with the love of finery, made up the circle of what took up her thoughts, the daughters participating in their parents' tempers. But what was wonderful indeed, the sons were honest, sober, industrious young men. In the midst of all this mirth and splendor, the father died and left them all totally without support other than their own industry could procure for them. Slender provision, indeed. Miss Molly, the eldest, was about twenty-two at the time of her father's death, and her sisters were each of them younger than her, and Alice a year younger than Jenny, and about eighteen. The mother was at her wit's end to know how to procure a living for herself and them. But an old gentleman in one of the colleges, to whom Peter had been very useful, and who therefore retained a grateful sense of his service, was so kind as to give fifty pounds towards putting out the daughters, and took care to see the youngest Alice placed with a mantua-maker in London. Molly fell into a consumption, as was generally said, for the love of a young gentleman who used to spend his evenings at her father's and who marrying a young lady of suitable birth and fortune to himself, was retired into Shropshire. Jenny ran away with a servitor, and was lost to her mother and her friends, so that Alice had it in her power to be tolerably provided for, if she had inclined to have lived virtuously, and not to have frustrated the offers of a good fortune. But she was wild and silly from her cradle, born without capacity to do good to herself, and endued only with such cunning as served her to ruin others.
The first intrigue she had after her coming up to London was with a young fellow who was clerk to a justice of the peace in the neighbourhood. Before he saw Alice he had been a careful, industrious young man, and through his master's kindness had picked up some money. But from the time that his master had a suit of clothes made up with Alice's mistress, and which occasioned her first coming about the house, poor Mr. Philip became the victim of her charms, and moped up and down like a hen that had lost her chickens. It was not long before the justice's daughters found out his passion, and having communicated their discovery to the maids, exposed him to be the laughing-stock of the whole house. Never was a poor young fellow so pestered. One asked him whether he liked the wife with three trades. Another was inquiring whether he had cast up the amount of remnants of silk, shreds of lace, and the savings that might be made out of linings, facings, and robings. The justice took notice that Philip had left off reading the news, and the old lady wondered whether he had forgotten playing upon the organ in her husband's study. But all this served rather to increase than to abate his passion so that he neglected no opportunity of meeting and paying his addresses to his mistress. Alice was no less careful on her side, and in a short space it was agreed that she should run away from her mistress, of whom she was grown heartily weary, and that Philip should counterfeit most excessive grief at his loss, in order to prevent the least suspicion of his being privy thereto. Having adjusted this, it was not long before they put their design into execution, and Philip first having provided a lodging for her in Brewer Street, she, on a Sunday in the evening, when all the rest of the family were out, removed from her mistress's house in a court near the Strand, taking all that belonged to her in a hackney coach, leaving the key at an alehouse. Philip had so good a character that the grief he affected on this occasion passed for reality upon all the house, and the flight of Alice had no other effect than to excite a new spring of raillery on the loss of his mistress. He laid out the greatest part of what he had saved during five years' service in furnishing out two rooms for her very neatly, passing himself where she lodged for the son of a gentleman of fortune in the country, who had married against his friend's consent, and was therefore obliged to keep his wife in a place of privacy until things at home could be made easy. For some time the lovers lived mighty happily together, and nothing was wanting to complete Philip's wishes than that they were married. For Alice never making such a proposal now and then disturbed his thoughts and put him a little out of humour. Things remained in this state with a little alteration for about five months, until an Irish captain coming to lodge pretty near where Philip had placed Alice, he found a way to see her twice or thrice, and being a fellow of a smooth tongue, a handsome person and an immoderate assurance, it was not long before he became master of her affections. The temper of Philip having been always too grave for her, in about three weeks' time she let the captain in to the truth of the whole story, and at his persuasion, during the time Philip was at Surrey Assizes, sold off the furniture of her lodgings, and, directing a letter to be left for him at his master's house by the penny post, moved off with her new gallant. It would be impossible should I attempt to describe it, to describe the agony the poor young fellow was in at the receipt of Alice's epistle, in which she told him flatly she was weary of him, and had got another gallant, and saying that if he tried to look after her, or give her any other uneasiness, she would send a full account of all things to his master. The jilt was sensible this would keep him quiet, for as he depended solely upon his favour, so a story of this sort would have inevitably deprived him of it for ever. It answered her intent, 
and the force he put upon his passions cost him a severe fit of sickness. Alice, in the meanwhile, indulged for about a week with her Irish captain, at the end of which he beat her and turned her out of doors. It was in vain for her to talk of her goods and her clothes. The captain had carried her amongst a set of his acquaintance, who on the first quarrel called her a thousand foolish English whores, and bid her go back to her justice's clerk again. In the midst of her affliction, with nothing on but a linen gown, and about three shillings in her pocket, the watchman coming his rounds, found her sitting on the steps at the door where the captain lodged. He asked her what she did there, she said her husband and she had quarrelled and he had shut her out. The watchman was going away, satisfied with the answer. When the captain called out at the window, told him she was a street walker, and bid him take her away. The landlady confirmed this, and the fellow laying fast hold of her shoulder, compelled her to go with him to the watch house. However, a shilling procured her liberty and a favourable report to the constable that she was an honest young woman who had the misfortune to be married to a bad husband, who turned her into the street, and she was afraid would not suffer her to come in again that night. Upon hearing this, the constable bid her sit down by the fire, gave her a glass of brandy and promised her she should be as safe and as easy as the place would allow her for that night. But unluckily for Alice, as she went to take the glass out of the constable's hand, he knew her face, and happening to be the baker who served the mantua maker with bread where she lived, the next morning he conducted Mrs. Alice, much against her will, home to her mistress. One of her fellow apprentices ran with the news to the justices, and one of the daughters whispered it in Philip's ears, as he was writing a recognizance in the justices' book. Philip no sooner heard it but he fell down in a swoon, and about half an hour was spent before they could bring him again to himself. The young lady who had played him the trick immediately quitted the room, and he opening his eyes, and perceiving her gone, pretended it was a sudden fit, and that he had been used to them when a child. Much as he had suffered by this ungrateful woman, he took the first opportunity to go to a coffee-house within a door or two of her mistress, in order to learn what had become of her. There was but one person who had been trusted with his ever having visited her at all, and they too were ignorant that she had ever run away with him. Philip therefore sent for his confidant, from whom he received information that after snivelling and crying for an hour or two, she took advantage of being left alone in a parlour, although the door was locked, and getting out at the window into the back yard, made a shift to scramble over the top of the house of office into the court, and so made her escape to the waterside, where her mistress found she had taken a pair of oars but though they followed her to Falcon Stairs, yet they were not able to retrieve her. Philip at this news was exceedingly grieved, and returned home again very disconsolate on this occasion. Alice, in the meantime, lurked about in St. George's Fields till evening, and then crossing the bridge walked on towards St. James's. However dirty and despicable her dress, Yet as she had a very pretty face and a very engaging manner of speaking at first sight, she drew in a merchant's bookkeeper, as she walked down Cornhill, to carry her to a certain tavern at the corner of Bishopsgate Street, where, after a good supper and a bottle or two of wine, she engaged him to take her to a lodging, and by degrees to give her a great deal of fine clothes in return for which she flattered him so greatly that he grew as fond of her and as much a fool as ever Philip had been. In the meantime her sister, who was much of her disposition, had been turned off by a young fellow she had run away with from Oxford, and in a miserable condition had trotted up to town, 
in order to see whether she could have better luck with another gallant. One night, as she was strolling through Leadenhall Street in her vocation, she saw her sister Alice and the bookkeeper who kept her, walking home with a servant, and a candle and lantern before them. Jenny did not think fit to speak to them, but dogging them privately home, called upon her sister the next day and was mighty well received. The couple now took every opportunity, notwithstanding the allowance of the bookkeeper, to enable Alice to stroll out with her together, and wandered about nightly in quest of adventures, till it began to grow towards ten o'clock, and the fear of a visit from her keeper drove Alice to her lodgings. This trade, without any remarkable accident, was practiced for about three months, when on a sudden the bookkeeper vanished, and for three weeks' time Alice heard not a word of him. This threw both the sisters into a heavy peck of troubles, and the more because he had always kept it a secret in whose family he lived and went to the people where Alice lodged by another name than his own. However, they got money enough by sparks they picked up to live pretty easily together, and that no misfortune might go too near their hearts, they fell to drinking a quart of brandy a day. It seems the woman at whose house they lodged was herself given to drinking, and so by treating her they fell into the same vice. The landlady in return was mighty civil to them, and every now and then invited them downstairs to drink with her. One evening when they were below stairs, there happened to be some discourse about a trial at the Sessions house, whereupon Alice expressed her desire of seeing the trials, and her sister agreeing in the request, their landlady agreed to carry them the next morning. Accordingly they were at Sessions house by the time the court was set, and the two young sluts were exceedingly merry at the wretched appearances the poor creatures made at the bar. In the midst of their mirth, a man was brought up to plead to his indictment, who had only a blanket wrapped over his shirt to keep him from the weather. They were laughing and talking to some of the people behind them, when Jenny patted her sister to take notice of what the man was charged with. Alice listened and heard the indictment read, which was for breaking open an escritoire and taking out of it ninety guineas two diamond rings, and a good tweezer. When the clerk had done reading, the criminal answered with a low voice, not guilty, and the keeper thereupon took him from the bar. As he turned, his face being towards them, Alice saw that it was the bookkeeper who had lived with her, and in a low voice whispered her sister, As I hope to live, it is our Tom. They did not stay much longer, but began to consider as soon as they got home what was to be done. Alice was sensible that the tweezer case mentioned in the indictment had been given her, and was under a thousand frights and fears that it should be discovered, and was above all wondrous careful of her landlady, that she did not go any more to the trials that sessions. The day they heard that sentence was passed, Jenny went to one of the runners at Newgate, and giving him a shilling, asked what had become of such a person. The fellow answered that he was to be transported. Jenny came immediately home with the news to her sister. She shed a few tears and said, What if he should want in Newgate? Nay, says Jenny, let him want what he will. I'm sure you shall not be fool enough to pawn your things to relieve him. And as her fit of compassion was soon over, so they determined to remove their lodgings for fear that if he were under necessity, as they could not well doubt he was, considering the figure he made at his trial, he might send to her. But they needed not to have been under any apprehensions of that sort for shame and grief had brought him so low that the jail distemper seizing on him, he died the same week he had been tried.
and the runner to whom Jenny had given the shilling, remembering her face, stopped her in the street and told her the news. When Alice heard it, she pretended to fall into fits and express abundance of sorrow and concern. The sorrows were not, however, so deep but that Brandy and two days' time effaced them so well that she dressed in the best manner she was able in order to go out and look for a spark. Unfortunately for her, her amours produced the usual consequence, a loathsome distemper, which, seizing about the same time both her sister and herself, through want of proper care, ruined both their constitutions. And the ill consequence being increased by the use of improper food, they were soon after in such a condition that their infamous trade of prostitution fell off, and they were in danger of starving and rotting. In this distress they knew not what to do, till at last advising with an old woman whom they had scraped acquaintance with, she readily offered them the use of her house, and to engage for them a surgeon, who should complete their cure. The sisters were overjoyed at this, and in a hurry accepted her offer, removing themselves and what little valuable movables they had the next week. They were received with great courtesy and kindness, and the old woman, from an acquaintance of three weeks, assured them that they were no less dear to her than if they had been her own daughters. This treatment continued until they were in the height of a salivation, and then they were acquainted with usage of another sort. This distemper was very expensive, their course of physic very troublesome, it required much attendance, they were strangers to her, and so by degrees the old woman got from them most of the trinkets they brought with them, so that when they were come a little to themselves, and nourishing food was proper to restore them to perfect soundness, they had no way left to procure it but by pawning or selling their clothes, which being quickly done and the money spent, nakedness and poverty became their companions. Thus plunged in misery, they were exposed to the daily insults of the bod, who treated them with great cruelty now she had them absolutely in her power. Alice was so very uneasy under it, that having one night got a few clean things about her, she resolved to venture out in a thin linen gown, to see what might be done to free them from these difficulties. She had not got lower than Southampton Street, in the Strand, before a gentleman well-dressed, though much in liquor, invited her to go with him to his chambers. He carried her as far as Essex Street, and then turning down to the temple, brought her into rooms up two pair of stairs, richly furnished. She saw nobody that he had to attend him, but everything seemed in very exact order, and so without further ceremony to bed they went. His weight of liquor soon forced him to sleep, but Alice, whose head was full of the miseries she had so long gone through, arose, put on her clothes, and searching his pockets, found a gold watch, nineteen guineas, and a large gold medal. She was so much surprised with the richness of the booty, and yet this being her first fact, so confounded within herself, that she knew not well what to do. At last, with great difficulty, she forced open the chamber door, which he had locked, and laid the key where she could not find it. Next she came to the outer doors of the chambers, in which the key was, and so there was no difficulty in getting out but then finding it impossible to shut the door after her without locking it, she even did so, and carried away the key. She made all the haste she could home to her landlady, and without considering the consequence, paid her six pounds which she demanded, and got some clothes out of her hands, which she had retained as a security for the money. Then she removed with her sister, as secretly as she could, to an inn in Smithfield, and from thence, the next day, 
they removed to a little lodging in a narrow lane by St. John's, where downright fear made them keep so much within doors that they had almost spent all their money in six weeks' time without thinking of any method to get more. At last, Jenny, as being least in danger, equipped herself as well as she could, and ventured about nine o'clock one evening into the streets. She walked about half an hour without meeting with any adventure, but at last picked up an innocent country lad. They had not gone far towards a tavern before the constable and his bodyguard of watchmen surprised and hurried them away to the Wood Street counter. There she remained until the next day, when it was intimated to her that if she could produce a couple of guineas they would be looked upon as good bail. She sent for her sister Alice, who not having so much money, foolishly offered the gold medal as a security. Some of the limbs of the law thereabouts were acquainted with the gentleman of the temple who lost it, and it being shown up and down to know its value, they declared it was stolen, and Alice, instead of procuring her sister's liberty, was forced into the same prison and confined with her. As it was about three weeks to sessions, they were permitted to remain at the counter during that time. This was a deeper plunge into misfortune than they had ever yet known, and the fear of hanging was so strong that Alice, in order to avoid it, resolved upon making an application to a person to whom otherwise she would never have made herself known. Who should this be but Philip, who was lately married, but still did the business of his old master the justice, and therefore was always to be met with at his house, though he had now got a little place upon which he was capable of living pretty handsomely. Alice's letter reached him just as he was sitting down to dinner. The surprise he was in was so great that it could not be hid from the company. However, to cover the cause of it, he pretended that it brought him news of a person being gone off for whom he was bail, and which obliged him not to lose a minute in going to see what might be done. So putting on his hat, and entreating some gentlemen who were at the table with him not to disturb themselves, for he should be back in half an hour, away he went directly to the counter, and having influence over the people in power there, he prevailed to have her let out to an adjacent tavern. The affliction she had gone through had altered but not impaired her beauty. Philip, ill-used as he had been by her, could not forbear bursting into tears at the sight of the miserable condition in which she was. As soon as his surprise was a little over, she acquainted him with the true state of the case, and begged his assistance in prevailing on the injured gentleman to soften the prosecution. He promised her all that was in his power, but desired to know after what manner she intended to live, in case her liberty could ever be regained. She cried and promised to work hard for her living rather than fall into that miserable plight again, and then told him how unfortunately it happened that her sister also was involved in the same calamity. At parting, Philip presented her with a guinea, and told her she should have the same every week while she remained there, assuring her also that he would not fail coming to her the next day at noon, and informing her of the temper in which he found her antagonist. It happened that the Templar was Philip's intimate acquaintance, and had a seat near his father's house in the country. Philip told him the truth of the story, and how he came to interest himself so far in the affair. The gentleman was not hard to be prevailed on, and said he did not conceive it would be of any service to the women to let them be set at liberty, considering the course of life they would be obliged immediately to fall into for bread, that for his part he inclined rather to procure them liberty to transport themselves, and that they might not be destitute in a strange country, he was not averse, notwithstanding his loss,
to give them something towards putting them in a condition of getting their livelihood when they got over. Philip readily agreed to this, though he was fearful of its proving an expedient little agreeable to the women. However, the next day, when he went, he sent for them both to the tavern and proposed it. Alice said it was the most agreeable thing that could have befallen her. She was sensible of the manner in which she had lived in her native country, and of the difficulty there would be of her amending here, and though her sister Jenny was at first very averse, yet she quickly brought her to be as complying as herself and to wish nothing more than the possibility of living honest in any of the plantations. Philip carried this news at night to the temple and the gentleman there, who was a great humorist, was so much taken with the temper and spirit of Alice that he would need see her again, and thereupon accompanied Philip the next day to the place of her confinement. There everything was soon settled. The Templar procured their discharge, put them to board at a house which he could command, and bargained with a captain of a New England vessel for their passage thither, not as for persons who had been guilty of any misdeeds here, but as of young women of good families, who were unwilling to go to service here, and had therefore got their friends to raise as much money as would send them over there, where perhaps they might meet with better fortune. In short, their two benefactors furnished them with things to the amount of two hundred pounds, accompanied them themselves on board the vessel, and recommended them to the captain with as much earnestness as if they had been near relations. Coming in this light into the abroad, they were received with great hospitality, and treated with much kindness and respect, and in fine, after remaining there about a year, Jenny married a gentleman of as good fortune as any in the country, and her sister, not long after, had the same luck. Jenny did not indeed survive it long, but Alice outlived her first husband, and marrying a second, returned into England where she is still living in as much respect and esteem as any gentlewoman in the county where she inhabits. End of section 43. Recording by Geoffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Chapter 44 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. An account of the horrid murder of Mr. Whittington Darby, committed in his chambers in the temple on the 11th of April, 1727, for which one Henry Fisher was apprehended and committed to Newgate, from whence he escaped. The deceased Mr. Darby was a young gentleman who made an extraordinary good appearance in the world. He generally wore fine rings, rich snuff-boxes, and an extraordinary gold watch about him. These things possibly tempted a needy person of his acquaintance to be guilty of that barbarous murder which was committed upon him. He lived in the chambers belonging to Sir George Cook's office in the temple. His servant lived in another place and went home every night. It happened the night before, or rather in that wherein he was murdered, that Mr. Darby had a good deal of company with him, who, supping late, they did not go away until eleven o'clock, when Mr. Darby's servant also retired to his lodgings. The next morning, being Tuesday, about nine o'clock, Mr. Darby was found dead in the said office, his skull penetrated with a pistol ball, his ear and hand cut, his rings, watch, and other valuables taken away, 
besides his escritoire broken open and his money and linen taken from thence. The next day the coroner's inquest sat thereon, but being able to make no discovery of the murder, they thought fit to adjourn sine die as soon as the coroner had made an order for the interment of his corpse which was done accordingly in a vault in the church of St. Andrew's, Holborn. Some time passed before any light was got into this affair. At length Mr. Moody, who had been upon the coroner's inquest who had sat on the body of Mr. Darby, received information that one Fisher, who had been in very bad circumstances, and as an acquaintance had been relieved under him by the deceased Mr. Darby, was all on a sudden, since the committing of that murder, observed to have a great deal of money. He had paid some debts which had been troublesome to him, and was observed to have some valuable things about him which had never been seen before. These circumstances appearing altogether very suspicious, Mr. Moody acquainted Mr. York with it, who had been very assiduous in taking all measures possible for the discover of this horrid assassination. He falling readily into Mr. Moody's opinion, they agreed together that the likeliest method to find out the truth was to go to Mr. Willoughby, who was Fisher's landlord, and known to be a very honest man. Accordingly, they went to him in a tavern in Southampton Street, where they understood he was, and falling into discourse about Mr. Darby's murder, they insinuated to him the suspicions they had of his lodger. Returning to his house, Fisher being away, Mr. Willoughby went to his room and broke open a box, and found in it the top and bottom of a snuff-box, a vizard mask, and a pair of laced ruffles. The remains of the snuff-box Mr. York knew to have belonged to the deceased, and had reason to suspect the ruffles also to have been his, so that it was immediately agreed to go before the Honourable Sir William Thompson in order to procure a warrant. Footnote. Sir William Thompson, 1678-1739, was Recorder of London in 1715, Solicitor General two years later, and in 1729 became Baron of the Exchequer. End of footnote. There they made an affidavit of the several circumstances attending their discovery, and Sir William upon the examination also of a lady who produced a piece of lace before she had seen the ruffle and declared that if it were Mr. Darby's it must tally therewith, which on a comparison it did exactly, granted a warrant. It appeared also at the same time, upon the oath of Mr. Willoughby, that the day Mr. Darby was murdered, Fisher borrowed half a crown of him to pay his washerwoman, and was in the utmost necessity for money. A woman swore that a person very like Fisher was hovering about Mr. Darby's chambers the night the murder was committed, and it was proved by the oath of another person that Fisher came not to his lodgings till two o'clock on Tuesday morning, on which Mr. Darby was murdered. About eight o'clock a porter came and informed Mr. Fisher of Mr. Darby's being murdered, at which he showed little concern and locked himself up for some hours. Things being thus over at Sir William Thompson's, Mr. Willoughby, Mr. York, and Mr. Moody returned to Fisher's lodgings. About two o'clock in the morning he came in, and they seized him, having a constable and proper assistance for that purpose. On Sunday noon he was carried before Sir William Thompson in order to be examined, where he said that about the latter end of the week in which Mr. Darby was murdered, as he was passing through Lincoln's Inn Fields about four in the afternoon, he took up under the wall of Lincoln's Inn Gardens, a white paper parcel in which were contained several things of great value belonging to the deceased. Some of the diamonds he acknowledged he sold to a jeweller in Paternoster Row for ten guineas, the watch he pawned for nine guineas to a person at a brazier's in Bond Street, 
and sold the gold chain and swivels to a person in Lombard Street. He absolutely denied all knowledge of the murder, and said that at the time it happened he was at a billiard table in Duke Street by St. James's. When taken, there was found upon him two of Mr. Darby's rings with the stones taken out, wrapped up in a paper, with his seal, the arms of which were taken out, and in these circumstances he was committed to Newgate. Soon after this, the coroner granted his warrant, and an order being thereupon obtained from the commons, Mr. Darby's body was taken up and in the presence of several persons, his head opened by an eminent surgeon, who found a large lacerated wound near the left ear, the temporal bone on that side being very much fractured, several pieces of which stuck in the brain on the same side. He found likewise the temporal bone on the other side, exactly opposite, broken. The pieces thereof were not removed from their places, but easily removed upon his attempting to take them away. He took out the brain, and the bullet dropped upon the pillow which lay upon the ground under his head. It appeared, upon comparing the said bullet taken out of the head with some other bullets found in custody of Henry Fisher, at that time in Newgate on suspicion of the murder, that it seemed to have been cast in the same mould, and when weighing it with one of these bullets, it was very little lighter, and it fitted the bore of one of the pistols which was found in Fisher's custody, even that pistol which by some signs were looked on to have been discharged, though afterwards loaded again. This Fisher was the son of a very eminent clothier in the west of England, who had sent him to London and put him out clerk to an attorney, and had done everything in his power which he was able, and which was reasonable for him to do but he being extravagant, lived far beyond the rate which was consistent with the supplies he received from his father, so that when pressed by his necessities, he had often applied to Mr. Darby for relief. When in Newgate, he affected a most unreasonable gaiety and unconcernedness in his behavior, although the circumstances were so strong against him as occasioned it to prevail as the general opinion that he would be convicted. However, he and the famous Roger Johnson took the advantage of the workmen laboring on the cells which were then building, and by breaking a hole through a place done up only with lath and plaster, they got down one of the workmen's ladders, and so made their escape. Johnson was afterwards retaken and tried for breaking prison, but alleging it was done by Fisher, he was acquitted, and this Henry Fisher, the supposed murderer of Mr. Darby, was never heard of since. End of chapter 44 Recording by Jeffrey Wilson, Ames, Iowa Chapter 45 of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward. Chapter 45. The Life of Joshua Cornwall, a Thief and Housebreaker. Though vices are undoubtedly the chief instruments that bring unhappy persons to that ignominious death which the law has appointed for enormous offences, yet it very often happens that folly, rather than wickedness, brings them first into the road of ruin, in which, led on by delusive hopes, they continue to run, until a disastrous fate overtakes them, and puts an end at once to their vicious race and to their lives. The criminal, whose memoirs at present employ our pen, is such an example as I hope, while it entertains, may also instruct my readers to avoid his errors. This unfortunate man was the son of reputable and honest parents in the town of Brigg, in the county of Lincoln. Their circumstances were such as enabled them to give him an education, and the desire they had of doing everything that was possible for their son 
inclined them not to be wanting in this particular. His mother was fond of him to a fault, and being permitted by her indulgence to run up and down amongst young people of his own age, riding across the country to friends and other diversions of a like nature, he lost all liking to things of serious nature, and without thinking how to procure the necessaries of life, was altogether taken up in enjoying those pleasures to which he had the greatest inclination. In the midst of this pleasant situation of things, at least as it appeared to him at that time, the prospect was darkened by the death of his mother. His friends retained for him a due paternal affection, but had no notion of permitting him to go on the life he led, and therefore to break him of that as well as to make him acquainted with an honest method of getting his living, his father put him out apprentice to a baker in Hull. But as kindness seemed of all things the most fatal to this unhappy man, so the acquaintance and friendship which his master had for Cornwall's family became a new means of leading him into misfortune, for treating the young man rather with a tenderness due to a son than the severity which is usually practised towards apprentices and servants, it gave him an opportunity of renewing his old course of life. Instead of inclining him to behave in a manner which might deserve such lenity, it gave him, on the contrary, occasion frequently to abuse it by running from one dancing bout and merry-making to another, without the least care of his master's business who out of downright affection forbore to restrain his follies with that harshness which they deserved, and which any other person would have used. At length, having acquired so great a habit of laziness, and so strong an aversion to business, that he found it impossible for him to live longer in the country, he came up to London, that great receptacle of those who are either unable or unwilling to live anywhere else. Here he got into service as a footman with several persons of worth and discharged his duty well, as indeed it was a kind of life which of all others suited him best, so that he obtained a tolerable reputation, whereby he got into the service of one Mr. Fenwick, a gentleman of affluent fortune. Here it was that through desire of abounding in money he either drew in others or was drawn in himself to commit that crime which cost him his life. It seems that in Mr. Fenwick's family there was a great deal of plate used which stood on a buffet. This tempted Cornwall, and it is highly likely gave him the first notion of attempting to rob the house. When he had once formed this project, he resolved to take in one Rivers, a debauched companion of his, as a partner in the designed theft. This Rivers was certainly easy enough prevailed on to join in the commission of this fact, and after several meetings to consult upon proper measures, Rivers at last proposed that their scheme should be put in execution as soon as possible, and that he might the more perfectly conceive how it was to be managed. He went home with Cornwall and looked upon the house. Soon after this they held their last consultation, and Cornwall saying to Rivers that he must bring some other persons to assist him, Rivers made choice of one Gerst, and coming with him at the appointed hour, Cornwall in his shirt opened the door and let them in. In the buffet there stood a lighted candle in a silver candlestick, by which they were directed to the rest of the plate, which as soon as they had taken out they placed all together upon the carpet, and fell next to rifling Mr. Fenwick's bureau, and took out a great quantity of linen, a lady's lace, the tea equipage, and two silver canisters. Then making it up in a bundle, it was carried to Rivers' lodgings in Vinegar Yard, Drury Lane. All this could not be performed with so little noise as not to disturb the family. Mr. Fenwick himself heard the noise, being awakened by his wife, who had heard it for some time, but it ceasing, they fell asleep again, until one of the servants came up in the morning, and told his master that the house had been robbed, the plate taken away, and a window in the back parlour left open, 
about which, as he could observe no marks of violence, he was led to suspect it was opened by somebody in the family, upon which Cornwall and a maid in the house were immediately thought to have a hand in. However, as there was no sort of proof, Mr. Fenwick forbore seizing them at that time, and contented himself with advertising his plate, which advertisement coming into the hands of a pawnbroker, to whom a part of it had been pledged, he immediately gave notice that it was pawned to him by Rivers. A warrant being upon this obtained for the searching of Rivers' lodging, a note was there found, directed to Thomas Rivers, Glower, in Guy's Court, Vinegar Yard, Drury Lane, in which were these words, Dear Tom, let me see you at seven o'clock tomorrow morning, at the Postern Spring Tower Hill, be sure. Joshua Cornwall Upon this Cornwall was immediately taken up, and Gerst readily offered himself an evidence. In a few days after, sessions coming on, Joshua Cornwall and Thomas Rivers were indicted for burglariously breaking the house of Nicholas Fenwick, Esquire, and taking thence diverse pieces of plate, to the value of eighty-five pounds nineteen shillings, Holland shirts to the value of twenty pounds, and other goods of the said Mr. Fenwick, on the eighth day of September, 1730. This indictment being fully proved, the jury found Timos Rivers guilty thereof. But being dubious whether Joshua Cornwall, as a servant within the house of Mr. Fenwick, could be properly convicted of burglariously breaking into his said master's house, they found their verdict as to him special, which the judges having considered, they were unanimously of opinion, that the crime was in its nature a burglary, whereupon, at the following sessions at the Old Bailey, the criminal was brought to the bar, and being acquainted with their lordship's opinion, received sentence of death. Under conviction he behaved himself with great penitence, said he had not been guilty of many of those atrocious crimes, commonly practised by such as come to that fatal end whither his folly had led him. At the place of execution he, with great fervency, justified the character of a young woman who had lived fellow-servant with him at Mr. Fernwick's. He declared, as he was a dying man, that she was not in the least privy to the injury done her master, and that he had no other than an acquaintance with her, without either having or attempting any criminal conversation with her. Having done this justice, he seemed to die with much composure in the twenty-second year of his age on the 23rd of December, 1730. End of chapter 45 This is also the end of Lives of the Most Remarkable Criminals Who Have Been Condemned and Executed for Murder, the Highway, Housebreaking, Street Robberies, Coining or Other Offenses, Volume 2, by Arthur L. Hayward.